Okay, hello everybody. Thanks ever so much for coming to this online event, Voices of Adopted People. And as I say, over 300 people have signed up today to come to the event, which is fantastic. Uh, probably not everyone will make it, but we'll have a really good audience here. And um, since you can't uh, pop next, uh, look around you and see who's uh, joined, I'll just give you an idea of, of what that looks like. About half those people we think are participants in adoption. So plenty of adopted people, adopted parents, some birth parents. And then we've got lots of professionals here and other people who are interested in adoption and hopefully just some people who are just interested, which is great. So thanks ever so much for coming. I'm Mike Hancock and I'm a strategic lead at PAC UK. Um, we're an adoption support agency, so we work to support the lives of all parties affected by adoption. Uh, we're not a placement agency. We have contracts with regional adoption agencies around adoption support, mainly for adopted adults and birth parents. And we also work with adopted children and families through the adoption support fund and contracts too. And we work with adopted teenagers and we're going to hear from some of them later on. And we're also part of Family Action, that's our, if you like, parent charity. Just a couple of house rules. Obviously, it goes without saying, just uh, the chat is open, but please respect each other's views. People will be putting views forwards here. We haven't got a company line. We don't have a line on the day. People are able to say what they want, but uh, with respect to everybody else. Um, Self-care. As an adopted person, I find events where lots of adopted people getting, get together uh, fantastic, but also quite, um, you know, they fry me slightly. And I'm sure that may be true of other people. And we'll be talking about things which you might find difficult. And, uh, and if you need to just go and take a break and look after yourself, make a cup of tea, talk to someone else, then please do that. We're obviously recording the session today for people to be able to watch later on but uh, the audience yourselves won't be uh, recorded. So um, you don't have to worry about that. And we will have chat with presenters if we have the time, but we've got a fairly packed programme. So we did this last year. Uh, some of you may have been here uh, with, and we just had brilliant feedback. And we also sent out a survey to adopted people a few months ago saying, what would you like us to do during National Adoption Week? And uh, they said, do it again, please. Uh, so we did that. They also said, uh, put on events where we can meet other adopted people. And um, we've got one on Saturday in London. It's already full, I'm afraid. Um, and we realise, obviously, geography is a problem. So we'll try and put more of those on around the country um, and also expand our groups, our support groups for adopted people. And they also suggested um, uh, having a roundtable, having more discussion between different participants in adoption. So we've got a round table on Thursday that you can still sign up to, uh, where we will have two adopters, two birth parents, and two adopted people, all involved in contemporary adoption, just discussing issues around it. And we're taking questions from that. So if, uh, if, you, if you would like to um, ask a question, put it in the chat or email me at mike at pac-uk.org. Okay, today, We've got adopted presenters. We've got Lara Leon, who's a psychotherapist of great experience. She's done some fab films about adoption and she's also involved with How to Be Adopted. We do so much good work with adopted people, as do Adopted Futures. And we've got Shania Ives here today. She's going to be presenting with her birth mum, which is exciting. Uh, we've got Liz Wilde, who is a very experienced life coach. who's done lots of work with adopted people. And we've got some young adopted adults from the, our Bridging the Gap group in conversation with Tanya Killick, staff member, adopted staff member. Um, and it's really important to, for us to listen to their voice, of the voice of young adopted people. And we've also got Cassian Rawcliffe from UEA. He's not adopted, it's worth saying, but he has been helping us uh, yeah. with Professor Beth Neal put together research uh, from responses to our survey with adopted people about relationships with birth families. So he will be essentially presenting adopted people's views. Okay, uh, maintaining significant relationships and identity is a thorny one and a, and a really interesting one. And I think it's a really exciting time in adoption at the moment. And that's really because fundamental questions are being asked about contact and identity. What's the nature of adoption? Should it go forward like this? Is the severing of contact with birth family, apart from occasional letters, if people are lucky, is that okay? 
ad many adopted children grow up with very limited knowledge of their birth identity. Is that positive for them? What should we do about it? Now you throw into that mix the demand for an apology. Birth mums from the 50s, 60s, 70s have been pushing hard on this demand for an apology and uh, they have received from the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights its fundamental agreement that uh, adoption pre-75 effectively violated rights to family life. It's going to be really interesting to see what the government does with that. They might do nothing. They've got some other stuff going on at the moment, I can see. So nothing might come of that. But the fact that they've got it to that level is absolutely amazing and feeds into this sense that this is something that we need to think about. And that's really because in terms of contact and identity, not as much has changed as we might think. Yes, there is letterbox if people are lucky and people have life story books again uh, if they're lucky, although sometimes they're not written by their birth family. And that void that that leaves has damaging consequences. And we have adopted people from down the years reflecting on that, saying this wasn't very good for me. Should we be building connections rather than breaking them and ask ourselves, who does all that secrecy serve? So we're going to have different opinions on that. Some people won't be reflecting on that today. But among the adopted community, if you like, lots of people have got different views and we do at PAC UK. So I'm talking on a very personal basis in some senses here. But I think those questions need to get asked if adoption is to survive. And it has to adapt to a world where secrecy is, is both very difficult and starts to look a bit outdated. So for an adopted person like myself, who went through childhood knowing nothing about my birth family and my birth identity, it seems extraordinary that we are still doing this. What's standing in the way of change? Why hasn't this changed? Why isn't each adoption being treated individually around contact? Why isn't it being regularly reviewed? And why isn't direct contact being considered where it is safe to do so? Well, research is clear. Adopted adults are saying that contact can be positive, not in all cases. Birth parents are obviously up for that. And in the recent Adoption UK barometer, 70% of prospective adopters were saying they would consider direct contact with birth family. It's not the courts because they've been more challenging around adoption actually, and as we know, the numbers are falling. So what's the block? Well, I think to be honest, it's in, it lies in the agencies. There's a sense of, well, that's how we do it and how it's financed, and that's how we're gonna to continue to do it. Turning the ship seems to be very difficult. There's a perceived and probably correct lack of capacity to deliver direct contact in a fully supported way. That raises the questions of how supported it needs to be. And there is a very high risk averse attitude towards contact in the agencies. And that seems a real shame because I think that it can do some damage in itself. And there's also the fear that no one will or will want to adopt if there is direct contact. So why do I think this is important? Well, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of snapshots from my own adopted life to explain that really. Clearly, that explains my bias, but I think in terms of adoption in our own way, we're all a bit biased. Everyone's got their own viewpoint. And that's great. So I was relinquished almost straight from after birth. Uh, I, I was born to a young unmarried mother and spent the next year and a half in foster homes and children's homes. When my parents brought me home, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. I was what they would call now developmentally delayed and very withdrawn. Now, much later on, 30 years later, I talked to my mum, my adopted mum, about all this. And I said, what, what was that like bringing home this child uh, who was very withdrawn and, and, and wasn't relating to you? And she said, well, um, I remember the first time that you really broke down on me and cried, clung to me and cried. And I said, oh, when was that? She said, well, it was when you had all those teeth out. And I said, but I remember that. She said, yeah, you were nine or 10. Now, at the time I found that very shocking and I still find it shocking actually. I think many adopters, and, and I'm not saying all by any means, will recognize that picture of attachment and recognize how difficult it is. So I was taken from birth family. The links with my birth family were severed. I was moved about and told nothing about them. Funnily enough, a lot of that happens today. I'm just going to read you a very quick extract from my adoption file. It's printed on lovely 1960s paper. It says the little boy, he is a lovely child, thank you very much, and Miss H tried to keep him, but it was the usual story. He went to one foster mother after the other. She managed to see him occasionally, but then he did not know her. Both were upset. That's a similar picture, isn't it? 
I'm just going to read you the next very short paragraph because it's almost amusing if it wasn't sad. The alleged father, she gives no name, but says she met him only once at a party. He was connected with drama. She is a drama student. One presumes she had too much to drink, but she is an extremely nice type and it's hard to imagine her getting herself in such a predicament. So I read that out really just to say, goodness, that's a story, isn't it? I became a teenager. I was absolutely furious by the time I was a teenager. I got myself in lots of trouble. By the time I was mid-teenage times, I wasn't going home very much. And that is a pattern that we see today in our adopted teenagers. We see those searches for identity and meaning, feeling out of control, feeling lied about. And, and people really, you know, that shows when they are teenagers. And that's no um, criticism of my mum, my adopted mum, because she was great. I'm not criticising her for that. I'm just saying this is really difficult, the way that we do this. So I just want to fast forward to the, my early 30s. I was still furious. I was having a difficult time with relationships and life in general. And it was my mum who suggested I look into my birth family and why I was adopted. And I'm only grateful for that generosity of hers, that she wasn't threatened by that, she, that she thought that was worth it for me. And I kept her on board during that reunion. Eventually, after a bit, little bit of double rejection, I met with my birth mother in Manchester. I bang on the a flat door that she borrowed for the day, a woman opens the door. I'm pinching myself, I'm going, this is your birth mother. This is your birth mother. We go inside, I completely clam up. I didn't know what to say to myself, really. She said very soon, I don't feel guilty, you know. It took her two years to tell me who my father was, but we did eventually break through some of that stuff. We had a 20 year relationship with each other. She met my adopted mum once, the two, my two mums, if you like, although I don't really think of it like that. Um, and it was awkward, but it was, I suppose, the embodiment of the two lives that I have, which was extraordinary, really. I had different relationships with both those people. My, my adopted mum continued to be my mum, but when she became poorly and ultimately died, she was glad that my birth mother was around because she knew that she, you know, that was important to me. And what my mum realised was that to support and advocate for that relationship with my birth family, albeit as an adult, was the best thing for me. All the cliches about filling in the jigsaw were true. It helped me to settle down and we do intermediary for others here at BAC UK. And my goodness, it's complicated. And I do see that as a positive thing for people, for adopted people. People will say, well, contemporary adoption, that's completely different, isn't it? There's a lot more risk here, obviously, uh, and the reasons that children are removed are different, mainly. Now, I'm not minimising child protection. What I'm talking about here is about the forms of permanence and how we do this. I'm not talking about whether we keep children safe. We work with a lot of birth mothers at PAC, and as a gross generalisation, I'm going to say that many of them are damaged rather than dangerous. Most of them really love their children. I strongly recommend that you come on Wednesday to our online event for birth parents and listen to many of them talking. And why should we deny that love to those children? This permanence and what we do with children is about love and adopted children feeling loved. So many of them don't, even in adulthood, and that's a common problem. So all parties need to work together to bring that about. There's way too much ownership of children going on here. Not enough real thinking about their best interests, in my opinion, and it is just mine. That may mean continuing with siblings, contact with siblings, grandparents, other relatives deemed safe. And we have to accept that people change. Many birth parents go on to keep children and turn things around. So a bit of direct contact with their adopted children might be beneficial. I think we've got a lot to learn from people who've been involved in adoption of all ages. and. That's what we're trying to do at BAC UK at the moment, among provide, as well as providing services to all parties, is try and amplify those voices which aren't so well heard. Adoption UK has done a fantastic job of amplifying the voices of adopters, and I totally respect that. And so, but we are trying to add the voice of adopted people and birth parents specifically to that conversation. And it is a conversation between all those three parties. So as a, a parallel, if you like, to the Adoption UK Barometer, we're launching big consults this week for adopted people tomorrow and birth parents later in the week. And those are surveys of people's experience of their life and services 
which we can put alongside the adoption barometer and say, this is what these people think. Can we listen to them too? That would be great. We're also doing some messages for adopters films from those client groups. And we've just launched, if you're adopted, we've just launched last week, our adopted people's Facebook group. So if you would like to join and see lots of adopted people talking in private uh, and it's mod and it's um, watched during work, our work hours, then, uh, then if you search PAC UK Adopted People's Group on Facebook, answer the membership question and you're in. We've got our birth parent event on Wednesday, roundtable on Thursday discussion. Strongly urge you to come to any of those and I'll meet up on Saturday. So once again, thank you all for listening. And I am going to um, turn now to our first presenter, who is Lara Leon. Are you there? Are you there, Lara? I have just unmuted. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you lovely, Lara. That's fantastic. Hi. So Lara, Thank as you. I say, is a very experienced psychotherapist. She's involved with uh, adopted people, uh, how to be adopted, and uh, she's done some fabulous films. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Lara. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I did just uh, want to say thank you to PAC for the opportunity today to present the findings of my research um, on what is the first day of National Adoption Week. Um, I think it would be amazing to think that someday there might be national or even global adoptee week. But ded dedicating a day to the voices of adopted people is um, obviously an amazing start and um, I'm very proud and feel very privileged to be part of it. Um, I am going to be presenting the findings of my own research, uh, which asks the question, well-being in adults as adopted as children, what can we learn? Um, but before I do that, I um, just want to say a little bit about me, just so you know who, who's talking to you. I was adopted in 1970, just after birth, a bit like Mike. I was um, nine days old when I was adopted in the UK, and I was adopted by um, private adoption. I was um, brought up on the south coast of, the, of, of England, and um, I had no knowledge of my origins um, whatsoever growing up, again, similar to Mike. And um, my parents, like myself, but my parents were unsuspected, us unsuspecting victims. And I use the word victims because in our relationship within our household, they were also victims because the blank slate theory, which was the one that um, they adopted me within in good faith, um, really um, sort of undid our relationship and caused lots of pain for, for very, very many years. Now, um, the blank slate theory being, of course, the notion that you can take a brand new human um, that has no memory or that is indeed pre-verbal um, and just imprint yourself and your family and your life onto that sort of vanilla, as I like to say, vanilla baby or um, blank child. Um, and of course, we now know that's not the case. Um, but of course, my parents, yeah, I mean, it, it, became, it became a problem because of course they were unaware of the struggles that I was gonna have. Um, when they adopted me, they had been trying, like many couples, um, for, for many years to conceive um, naturally, and uh, that wasn't to be at the time. And yet, again, as happens very often, um, once they had adopted me, they had their own child a few years later, which was an unexpected gift, no doubt, at the time. And again, this set up a particular dynamic in the household, and... Um, I spoke a bit about this um, on Saturday, um, How to Be Adopted, which is a not-for-profit organisation supporting adoptees um, in the London area and online. We ran um, a re an online event, a retreat. I have been volunteer volunteering for them um, since the beginning of the year, and we ran an event which Pat kindly sponsored, so thank you for that. Um, but we talked about the dynamic um, and the differences, the ability that perhaps an adopted person has to respond to the parent um, and the differences compared with, say, a biological child. 
Um, and so that absolutely was um, something that was playing out in my household. And um, I was very aware of the differences, let's say, um, between myself as an adopted person and my sibling. So there were struggles. There were struggling, struggles in the family dynamic. And there was a lot of confusion, hurt and pain. Of course, they adopted me, um, as many families and people do, with the blank slate theory in mind, thinking that perhaps I was going to be the answer to, to all their problems and, you know, the answer to the um, problem of not being able to conceive. And of course, what was what was waiting was um, many years of, of pain um, on their part and many years of confusion, hurt and pain on my on my part, too. Um, and I think. I was as a young child, a bit like I think Mike just described, and we, we see this a lot, this kind of internalizing reaction to the trauma, to the separation um, from the biological mother. That is a very, very primal bond. And uh, that separation creates a trauma, which obviously babies such as myself and other pre-verbal and um, children who are not consciously aware of, of the trauma that that has created. Um, often go on to be very compliant and quiet and uh, withdrawn. And I think it's, um, well, I can laugh about it now in a way, I suppose you have to, but I was, uh, I was considered the perfect angelic child. What we now know is that I was actually traumatized <laughs> for, for many years. Um, but as I um, grew up and my sort of, you know, my, my neuro, neurodevelopment kind of happened and I was able to process the world around me then um, I was sort of dealing with that pain and that trauma in different ways and that caused other problems that caused um, a degree of um, anger a degree of certainly a lack of understanding um, you know bigger problems between myself and my parents I then went on to have um, identity issues, not kind of fit, not understanding how I fit into the world, you know, who I was within the world. Um, as with many um, adopted people, the relationship problems came later, but honestly started within that home. Um, my inability to bond, I think, in a way that they probably hoped and expected and certainly I wish could have been the case at the time you know it creates a lot of hurt um and then you know we had a real journey of it and then later on we did attempt to seek therapy my mother and I in particular our relationship was um was very troubled and we were adult and brave enough at the time to try and seek out therapy some sort of counselling for the two of us. And I mean, I'm going back 30 years now. Uh, there was obviously nothing available at the time. I know that's um, changing slowly, um, but there was nothing available. So we really were just left up to, up to our own devices. I mean, by, the, by virtue of the fact that the, the adoption had happened, uh, it was a private adoption. They, they had no support whatsoever. I had no support whatsoever. They were completely unaware of the psychological issues that I would have. They viewed my behavior as challenging and difficult and had no way of knowing why that was happening. So you can see it was a perfect storm, really. Absolutely nothing by way of support and help. So kind of fast forward. Um, yeah, my teenage years were pretty tricky and um, I was, I frequently found myself in sort of the depths of low mood and um, yeah, really struggling psychologically. So um, my first sort of, uh, I guess, experience of therapy, I think I was around 20, 21. And I really was struggling to understand myself. And that I think was very much as a result of being brought up in an environment whereby there was no narrative that kind of allowed for me having psychological problems um now a bit again like mike my my mother was always really aware that i might want to seek out my biological um roots at some point and and actually was really supportive um in that regard and did help me do that and so i i really believe that had she been aware that 
I was going to have all these psychological problems, our relationship would have been very, very different. Um, we're patching it up still to this day. You know, we 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 want to have a relationship with each other. Both of us want that and both of us need that. And I'm nearly 53 and we're still figuring out how we can make that work. Um, but we both want it. And I, I do think had she been aware of it when she adopted me and my father too, but I, I, I refer to her more so because it's it's that relationship has been the most difficult. Um, I think that our relationship would be very different, much stronger now. There would have been le different levels of expectation from her um, and more understanding around what I was going through. So my first sort of entry into therapy kind of helped and I've been in and out of counselling most of my adult life. Um, but I really wanted to understand what was going on. I, and at that time, I think it's worth saying, I have no awareness that what was going on inside my head was related to my adoption. I mean, that, that sort of came later and when all the pennies just dropped into place, I think. Um, but of course, because my family weren't saying, oh, it must be this or you're going through that or whatever. And I knew no one else who was adopted at all. I thought I was flawed. I thought I'm a mess, I'm broken. I need to go and get therapy or, or counselling. And so that's what I did. But I just wanted to understand humans and how it was that I was feeling one way and struggling in such you know, a profound way. And my sibling was having a very different experience of her life. And I think that's what really took me down, down that path to begin with. Fast forward, studying through psychology, um, qualifying as a counsellor, and then later um, as an ex existential psychotherapist, and that's what I do today. Um, existential therapy looks at how we find meaning within our lives. And um, so for me, it's really... It's, it really ties in with the whole fact of being adopted. You know, it's kind of, we question, we question so many different things um, and meaning is a really big part of that. So when I came to doing my uh, research element, I, well, we were told that we had to look into something, well, not that we had to, but that it was advisable to look into something which had, um, that, we, that really mattered to each of us and so of course there was only one topic I could look in, into and it was a really emotional journey really really emotional it all kicked off just before Covid and uh, it was a tricky year um, well it was two years altogether but it was a tricky year that particular year as I started this research because I traced and finally after many years discovered who my biological father was which I was never sure would happen but had also discovered he had died just um, four months previously. Um, my mother was just 15 when she had me. And um, so, she, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a difficult one. She wasn't able to, she was unable, unwilling to tell me who he was. So that was a big part of my life. And that all sort of came to culmination in the same year. But I wanted to research this because I hadn't understood myself at all at that point. I hadn't understood why I struggled so much to find levels, decent levels of well-being. And by this point, I hadn't really had any extended amount of time in my own life where I had felt happy and well and with living with well-being. So I kind of wanted to understand if there are other adoptees out there who are adults that were, and what were the practices and the behaviors and the things that had contributed to that in their lives. The other thing was, um, and, and this is something that really matters to me personally, is that um, I just really feel like we need to raise more awareness generally because um, adopted people, we have a lot to contend with as it is. And um, I don't think it's OK that we should have to justify why we feel the struggles that we feel and um, the difficulties that we have. It, it, it ought to be that people just get it, people just know. And I guess the only way that's going to happen is by um, these, these kinds of days and um, these kinds of events and just getting the message out there so that, you know, to me, it's logical that you remove a child from its biological um, parent that is such a primal bond. To me, it's logical, but probably because I've just studied it and researched it and lived it but to many it's not they don't even think that that severance is going to cause issues and and I feel like that that needs to change 
Um, to add to the knowledge base for therapeutic support, again, this was key for me, there was nothing available, but as a therapist myself, um, it's really vital that when a person who's been adopted finds the, the courage to go and sit in front of someone and talk about how they're feeling, that that person is very well aware of, of what the issues might be and able to support them through that. And then, of course, future adoptive parents of, of what kind of things to consider, because you know, my parents didn't have the, the option for that. And I, I think that's hugely unfair. I think that everyone should be able to go into this kind of thing with their eyes wide open and fully aware of, uh, of what might happen further down the line, what the struggles might be, you know, what the good things might be, but also what the struggles might be, because otherwise it just ends up with lots of feelings of confusion, hurt, inadequacy all around. Um, so that's why I did it. My approach to research was um, a literature review. Um, I was looking at existing literature that had um, studied the well-being or, or the lives of adopted people. Um, and I felt like that was really important because number one is I wanted to look at peer reviewed literature that existed, which meant that it was quality work. It also allowed me to look at a large um, sample size of um, adopted people. And it comprised a mixture of longitudinal studies, which were studies that had taken place with individuals over a period of time. And they also consisted of qualitative um, uh, studies which are personal accounts from people and quantitative which would be questionnaires so it's a com it was a combination of the two um, the lens through which i was looking at the research was um, the subjective view of well-being and dina was his was an eminent um, i think he's still working actually but he he looked into well-being it was his big it was his big thing is understanding how people um evaluate well-being in their lives and so it was looking at that and trying to understand how adopted people would evaluate their own sense of um, well-being and as an existential therapist I wanted to look at it through the phenomenological lens which is that kind of how do we experience ourselves in the world um, not to spend too much time on this but I wanted to look at the seminal works, which would be the kind of the first and early kind of really big, important research that, that informed later work. And then um, research papers which focused on adults, obviously. And it was very difficult to find. There was a lot of research. And I know a couple of other people doing research have found the same. There's a lot of research that looked at children, which, of course, is very important. Um, but there was very little that looked at adults. And of course, um, you know, how can we make sure things are going in the right dire direction unless we talk to adults who've <laughs> been through it? Sadly, uh, it was very hard to find any decent research coming out of the UK. Um, again, I know that's changing. I looked at books that were kind of big, um, kind of topic, yeah, big topics of, of um, child development and what it is to be adopted and, and that kind of thing. And so it was um, looking at older work and newer work and just kind of putting it all into a big pile and coming out with you know, the best quality work that I could find that had been carried out and just pulling out the main findings from those. It's so hard to find something from the UK. The majority of the studies were from North America and a couple um, from Europe. Nevertheless, it was all adults who were adopted as young people um, into same culture families because I really wanted to just focus on the fact of adoption as opposed to anything else in terms of how that would affect people. Um, findings, hardly surprising. Um, and you know, this is something that was probably expected, but obviously when you're doing research, you have to be neutral. <laughs> but yeah, these are the findings. Adoptees struggle with their mental health more than the average population. Many or most adoptees struggle with their identity, which of course ties in today, uh, into today. And again, you know, I was brought up in a white family as a white child, and I struggled hugely with my identity. Really, you know, really did struggle. I'd, I'd look at them and just feel I was like a round peg in a square hole. That's how I felt all of my life. Um, many or most adoptees struggle with attachment to others, which of course will feed into how they um, experience their well-being. 
The adoptive parents' own attachment style influences relationship with the adoptee and their attainment of well-being. Now, this is super interesting because obviously as um, adoptees, often we talk about our own attachment style and how that is impacted by the act of adoption. But what this study also found was that the adopting parents' adopt, uh, attachment style affected the quality of the bond with the child. And I'll come on to go uh, explain that a little bit more in a minute. Adoptive parents who are not able to conceive naturally, who may end up choosing adoption, and that's quite a um, journey that I think many go on and absolutely would never take away from the struggle of, of being a woman, expecting that you might be able to have your own child and then realising that you can't. That's a whole psychological journey in and of itself. But that's a big, that's a big journey because you're going from probably hoping you never have to contend <laughs> or consider, consider adoption to then saying, right, well, I'm, I'm prepared to accept that that might be what, what I'm about to do. Um, but if those feelings of loss associated with being a female who can't conceive are not dealt with, those will impact the bond as well. Um, adoptive parents who need to be ready and willing to work with issues of loss, trauma, identity, and contact to help the adoptee achieve better well-being. Well, this is kind of, you know, the, this is what my parents were never allowed to do because of the fact of not knowing that this was going to be the issue. So, so my own struggles were just, I'll use the word ignored because they weren't ignored, but not knowingly ignored. Um, adoptive parents who encourage informal and accepting open communication around the themes mentioned here. Um, so that's being proactive about that, because I think um, there are a few adopted children who are going to be brave enough to open up conversation around that. So that really needs to come from the adult, the adopting parent in the first place, um, so that they can feel that that's, that's a conversation that can happen in an accepting, open, non-judgmental way. Um, and it really is all about how the conversations are normalised. Therapeutic interventions at young age, adult, uh, teenage and young emerging adulthood to help the adoptee achieve better well-being. So those were the standout findings. Um, and from that, we were able to kind of pull together um, almost like a framework of what would be like if, if we could, if I could create like the, the ideal framework for what would happen in terms of a child going into an adoption, uh, you know, adopt an adopted family, what would that be like? So the findings and the recommendations taken from that would be, first of all, an adoptive parent with a secure attachment style. Now, of course, your average person's not going to know what their attachment style is, or um, even know what attachment style is in the first place. But what we know is that if somebody's got issues um, in bonding with others in the first place, if somebody is, um, if someone struggles to be in relationship authentically, they will, part, if they then adopt a child, they will, some of those, some of those difficulties will be transferred because the adopted child needs an authentic, open and loving bond um, for that to be a possibility with the adoptive parent. And so the adoptive parent needs to be secure in themselves. That takes work. I think that takes courage and um, often, will, often will require therapy before the um, adoption is considered. Parents who have grieved for received intervention and overcome any inability to conceive naturally. So yeah, that's a big loss for a woman, um, for a man also, I'm not taking that away, but there's something obviously about a woman and her biology that, that many women expect that they're just gonna be able to conceive and, and very often they can't. And it's very raw and it's, it's very painful and it's a huge loss. That needs to have been dealt with before any woman would enter into adoption ideally. Parents with the ability to mentalize the experience of their adopted child. Now, you know, we all know that probably the best relationships in our lives are where, where we feel seen and heard um, and where we're able to put ourselves in the, um, the shoes or the experience of the person we're talking to, they will feel seen and heard. And so that's what we're saying here is that what we found was um, that those people who are able to kind of do that and understand, or at least attempt to understand the experiences of the adopted 
um, child are likely to create a better bond, one that feels healthier and um, ultimately achieve better, give the child chances at better well-being. Um, number four, those who are ready to work with issues of separation, trauma, loss, identity and contact. So it's not just about knowing that those are going to be problems and waiting for those problems to sort of happen and then thinking, OK, what needs to happen about this is actually it taking a proactive role, I think, um, is, the, is the thing here. Encouraging those open and supportive you know, conversations in, a, in an informal setting around the table, having dinner, asking what's it like, what does it feel like, you know, be, Argue, you know, perhaps being the only adoptee in your school, in your school, in your class, which was my case, with no community, understanding that 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 child might be feeling very isolated and lonely with that. And so opening up conversation to normalize the need um, to normalize those feelings, I should say. And that would include siblings, other siblings within the house. Um, and then, of course, therapy, um, therapy available as standard from the, um, from early, um, from teenage and early adulthood um, into emerging adulthood. Of course, as we know now, it's lifelong, isn't it? So, um, but this is the age, I mean, certainly it's the age where I started to go off the rails and I think that's fairly common. So that kind of, as you're going into the teenage years and trying to process the world around you, there's an awful lot to try and process, but trying to understand yourself and where you fit into all of it is huge. Um, for an adopted person who hasn't got any, arguably, you know, potentially any idea where they came from, who they are, how it all works, how they're supposed to feel, you know, it's, it's um, really vital. So what all this means potentially is uh, for those of us, it's like, well, understanding that those would have been the things that might help. Well, for me personally, it helps me to go a bit easier on myself because I felt hugely guilty. And actually that was one of the, um, it was the topic of my presentation on Saturday was that of guilt that I was unable to bond um, in the way that I knew my parents needed me to bond and wanted me to bond and expected me to bond. I was unable to do that. As a result of that, yes, I felt hugely isolated and lonely for much of my life, but um, it just meant that I felt hugely guilty. I felt so guilty because I knew that I wasn't being um, what I sort of wanted to be. I, I wished I could have bonded better. I wish I could have had a better attachment. I wish I could have had a stronger relationship. But knowing some of this now helps me feel better about that. And I think, you know, that there's a lot of people that I speak to where that guilt is. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, it's another sort of disclaimer is like, it affects all all parties of the adoption triad guilt um but it's one of the issues that many adoptees struggle with is the uh, guilt of not being able to attach it helps us to um, grieve and understand and certainly um that's painful work but um to be able to understand that you have been limited potentially you know throughout your life and uh, to kind of heal from that and a chance to feel understood by others, I think, is massive. And I guess that goes back to the validation. For adopting parents, well, it's the opportunity to support their children in their adjustment and later attainment of well of well-being in, in all the ways that we know are possible. Um, and as I said, for many, this certainly at my when I was adopted, it wasn't available as common knowledge, but I know for a fact it's still not widespread. Um, I knew of, a, of an adoption last year with a baby, the parents had no idea. Um, opportunity for a closer relationship with the adopted child, which I'm assuming would be the goal of any adopting parent. Um, and also, this is a tricky one, but you know, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to a person that's not faced their own <laughs> inner demons who um, has not found it to be hugely helpful. So if some of those things mean that you have to look into yourself, um, and figure out what your shortcomings are and maybe to work on them, as I think we all need to do all the time, then um, that's, a, that's a benefit. That, that's a benefit to, you know, to the child as well, because they're definitely going to reap the rewards of that. 
future adoptees, well, of course, this is where it can all be different, isn't it? A family experience where, where the family and the environment is open to the, to the expectation, the understanding is able to nurture and to um, support that journey. Um, I think many adoptees struggle to bring some of these feelings up because of a sense of uh, a fear of uh, betrayal and um, that the adoptive parent might feel rejected somehow. Um, and, you know, is that if this knowledge was a little bit uh, wider known, then that wouldn't need to be another issue that an adoptive person would struggle with. Um, parenting that's just a bit more authentic. Look, none, not, none of us is perfect. Nobody could ever be. And, and parenting is difficult anyway. So no, it's not about being perfect, but it's just trying to make sure that there's no agendas in there and that there's open communication and dialogue around some of the struggles um, in an accepting environment, which all leads to a better bond, better mental health, lower anxiety. Um, and of course, ultimately, all of these main themes that we know we as adopted people struggle with, ultimately better well-being. For the therapeutic service providers, well, of course, um, uh, a model for working that takes account of the issues. It's, it's awful to, to say, but it's hard to believe, but it, it is happening. And I, I've spoken to, spoken to several people who have said that they've been told categorically by their counsellor that their adoption should not impact their mental health. You know, so I have nothing more to say on that, which is just unbelievable. Um, we, um, I know you're out there somewhere, Jilly, but we, those of us who are volunteering at um, How To Be Adopted, we've done a bit of research and we're in preliminary discussions with uh, some professional bodies and agencies regarding um, training materials for counsellors, um, which would help to uh, incorporate some of these things into, into their sort of uh, the model of working with adoption. And that's really exciting. That's very exciting. And really, for me, that's what it's all about, really. Um, so this, is, this wasn't part of my um, research, but this, this idea about the blank slate theory is, is quite, a, it's quite something really, isn't it? Considering we're all sophisticated human beings, <laughs> that we could think that a child would have absolutely no kind of experience, um, either pre-birth or immediately post-birth. Um, but this paper came up and it's, well, as I say, it wasn't part of mine, but this, the idea that um, the findings that this was their conclusion, pregnant women's psychological health may have consequences for fetal neurobehavioral development and consequently child outcomes. Well, I think, you know, for me, that seems reasonably obvious. A child spends that month, much time connected to their biological mother in that way. There's going to be some transference of emotion, but put yourself in the mindset of what it's like to, um, perhaps know that you're going to have to give up your child you know it depends on the circumstances they're all very different obviously but um there's going to be some sort of emotional experience that that mother is is, is having that's going to be passed to that child um in my own case my mother was 15 she was um put in her bedroom for the duration of the pregnancy there was shame around it she was stressed and traumatized as a result of um, how she had fallen pregnant in the first place. And so that is all very, very important to consider in terms of how it affects the unborn child. Of course, then the child's born, you take the child away from, from the mother, adding all of what we know that does on top of it. And um, no child is a blank slate, much less an adopted child. So um, I just want to say, yeah, on Saturday we had this event. I'm, I'm very nearly done. And the validation was amazing because um, the community is, hasn't been there for most of us, many of us, all of our lives. And so to be in a room, I'm, I remember came, coming to this event last year for the first time and being hugely emotional. Um, but one of the, uh, our guest speaker was Anne Heffron, who is an American, North American adoptee and author of the book, You Don't Look Adopted. And she came along to speak at the end of our event. She's still working on her own mental health um, at the age of 50 something. But what she does say is um, 
if people around me when I was young had known what we know now, my life would have turned out very differently. And so I feel, for me, that sort of just sums it all up, really. Um, I feel we have a duty to all those involved in future adoption to, to make sure this information is kind of out there, really. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, it's been a privilege. Um, I do have some resources on my website and all of my findings are in video format on my um, YouTube channel. So if you're at all interested, then take a look. But thank you very much indeed. Laura, that was, Laura, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That was just great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to yeah. mute myself because I don't want the feedback to... <laughs> okay. I mean, validation is the word, isn't it? And I think hopefully people are getting a lot out of that of, of that today. Certainly from looking at the chat, we've got lots of people, adopted people going, yeah, I felt exactly like that. And um, and it's, yeah. it's both great to hear adopted people saying that and also to see research validating those feel, feelings as well is, is really powerful for people. So uh, yeah, great feedback coming through the chat. Thanks ever so much. And thanks for the opportunity. So I'm just going to go on mute now. Thank you, Mike. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom along because, uh, actually that wasn't meant to be a pun, because we've got uh, Shania here, we're, we're, we're already running out of time, over time, which was inevitable really, I did that myself at the start, so um, Shania, are you there? She's there, okay, so Shania is, oh, is uh, from Adoptee Futures and she's going to be presenting with her birth mum Carol today. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to you, Shania and Carol. Nice to see you. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you, everyone at PAC UK for having us. Um, so happy to be here. And I'm so excited to have my birth mum with me. So I think usually I do these presentations and I'll do them with my co-founder and I'm all very professional, professional. But I think that today is such, such an emotional experience that we're able to be here together and, you know, tell our story. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, we've got a presentation, um, but we're just going to be... We're just going to be chatting really so it's going to be a really authentic um conversation and in hopefully you can see my screen oh sorry i'm pressing the wrong thing sorry my computer's slow um yeah so in making this presentation i think we had a lot of of conversations um that we hadn't had before which was really beautiful um i'm so sorry let me share my screen. This is the right time for my computer to be slow. Okay, let's try again. Okay, here we go. Perfect, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my presentation? All good? Perfect, so. Um, let me get our notes up. Um, so like I said, my name is Shania. I am the co-founder of Adoptee Futures. You can find us online at adopteefutures.org. Um, We're Adoptee Futures on Instagram, on Twitter. But yeah, I'm not here today to talk that much about Adoptee Futures. Um, so that's me, Mum. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Carol. I'm Shania's birth mom, and I'm here to tell my story. So yeah, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about our reunion, the ups and downs, how we've experienced it and how, how we're still experiencing it. So before we get into it, um, I wanted to talk a bit briefly about why I was adopted. Um, so I was adopted because my mum was an addict and so she couldn't look after me. So I went... Um, I went back and forth between you and my adoptive parents because they were a foster family. So they um, were fostering me, was it during the week? During the week. And then I'd go back to mum on the weekends to kind of try and keep up that relationship. But unfortunately, it didn't work out. Um, so that's why I was adopted. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next slide my computer is very slow so I'm so sorry about this um yeah so our story um so like I said um in the hospital we were together and then I left the hospital with um my adopted mum 
and um and then we were kind of back and forth and then we had that separation so I think that was our first separation um so for me the experience of our first separation I was I was a child um but growing up I did feel like there was something missing I wasn't sure what it was that was missing um I struggled with from a very young age I struggled with eating disorder um what I now know is depression low mood um anxiety a lot of anger as well I had a lot of anger issues and that was kind of linked into my eating disorder as well because I'd get angry because I'd feel like I would miss I was missing something basically I felt like I had one foot in and I felt like I had one foot out I felt like I had one foot with my adoptive parents and then one foot with you with my birth my birth father etc so during that first time when we were separated um yeah that's how I was feeling like something was missing like I was loyal to my birth family um and a lot of a lot of mental distress but what was your experience during our first our first separation what was that like for you um it's so strange because I felt that I had forgotten or pushed down or pushed aside um because Shania now being 22 so um the first time of experiencing that um because I had two children prior to Shania mm. and so Shania came like I think it was 10 years later and I'm being 35 so I was thinking oh so to have a child taken from you not coming out the hospital mm. with your baby that was uh, I can't find the word for that um mm. that was so new for me um and to see to know and to see somebody coming in to take your child mm. that you cannot leave the hospital mm. with that child yeah um uh, it led me to because I st um, being a addic addic um, um, uh, an addictive um, person at the time, I stopped. But then with that situation happening, yeah. it led me to relapse mm. and to, to 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 numb the pain or yeah. you know of yeah. that that feeling of I'm coming out the hospital with my empty hands yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. So um, but at the time I didn't. I was I was upset I was angry um but when I look back it was um for the safety of Shania because I was not in that place to take home a baby yeah. I'm just looking at oh that's my baby but that's not really how it really goes because mm. um of my addictive um, um nature at yeah. the time yeah so um yeah the experience was really strange or weird yeah, yeah yeah and then and then we spoke a bit about in the so we were separated at around around what age what do you mean Quite, yeah, uh, was that under a year yeah I think yeah. under a year and then yeah, yeah. our our first reunion was when I was around 12 13 we think mm -hmm. and so yeah so during that time I was I was kind of off I was having my mental health um, issues and struggles with identity as well not knowing where I was not knowing who I was and I was speaking to someone the other day actually mm. and I didn't realize that this was to do with adoption but um when I was little I didn't everyone had a favorite this oh I love pigs I love pink I love this I love that how kids are I love this I love that I love this I love that I didn't know what I liked what do you like I'm not sure mm. I'm not I, I don't know mm. I really don't know and that kind of not having the that identity mm. was really prominent for me during those what like 12 years and so we spoke a little bit about what your experience was like during those 12 years to from being in like full full addiction and in and out of prison to where you were able to to pull yourself out so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about about those years what made you what made you want to stop stop using so do you remember when we were speaking about with um that lady that sam sam so the social what, worker the social worker that yes. came um to me to say that um shania wants to meet you yeah you, you know she wants to meet her um birth mother yeah. and i was i was that was the um very um early um stage of my recovery because mm. i came into recovery in 2011 mm -hmm. and 
um, it wasn't even a year and, uh, and before I had, it's not even six months, I don't think, mm. um, before I had this lady mm. sending me a letter and, 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 and coming to see me to tell me this yeah. wonderful news. Yeah. I was very excited. Yeah. I was saying, wow, um, it's, everything seemed to align yeah. at the right time. Yeah. And to know that um, Shania wanted to, to know me, to meet me, uh, I, I don't know, I'm lost for words there. I'm yeah. just um, a bit emotional about that. Um, yeah. But it was a great, it was a great moment. Yeah. It was exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess for me, I was, I was living in France at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time when we were separated, um, my adoptive parents would, you know, they'd have pictures around the house of you, of my sister Shireen and Dean, along with our, our other family pictures. And, you know, they'd tell me about you and this and that. And they really, really like encouraged me um, whatever I wanted. And so at that time when I was like, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to meet um, mm -hmm. my birth mom and not even knowing that, you know, it was at that point where you had just come into recovery wow. and kind of everything fitting together. Mm was yeah mm. yeah and even into it's only now when we've been making this presentation that I really knew that right, that's right, where that's where right. everything had aligned right. really right. so um then we were going to talk about our first reunion so I've put pictures here on the screen so this is the our first reunion so after we'd been separated um when I was a baby and so we met up um we met in Brighton yeah, yeah which right, was yeah. lovely um and when we were making this presentation we were both speaking about how there are certain elements of our journey that we can't remember so I was like oh you know what was that like and you were like oh, I can't remember and I was like oh I can't really remember either and then <laughs> Um, I remember back to a therapy session that I had had mm. and my therapist saying to me, you know, when stuff can be really overwhelming or if a situation is really traumatizing, then, you know, we can forget about it. Mm. So, yeah, our first reunion in Brighton. Um, yeah. What was that like? What was that like for well, you? Oh, wow. Um, as you can see that um, the, um, there's the three of us there and um with some food so that's in the Brighton <laughs> at the whatever cafe or restaurant we were at and there's Shanar in the middle and then there's me to my right and there's my eldest Shireen to the left is that right? yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, my son he was meant to come but he didn't end up joining us um but um it was exciting because um I don't it it just I think I was open to I'm an open person mm. and you just um, said something before I forget, mm. Pauline and John, Shania's ad adoptive parents, they are the best. I couldn't ask for anything, anyone. Excuse me. It's okay. Mm. Yeah, what makes you? Because you you said it yourself. They were pictures. They didn't hide anything. Mm. The, 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 the energy and their vibration and um, they were open as well. They didn't feel because, all right, I've got this child, mm. that she's mine and, yeah. and let's block out everything else. Yeah. They were so open uh, and it made me. Open, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, when I see them, because even when the, uh, Pauline came and took me out of the hospital, I didn't yeah. know this woman. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's like she 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 didn't look down on me being um having a drug problem. Yeah. And um and that's how it continued. So meeting you at Brighton, Pauline there, and John was there, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. and the the photos with the greenery behind, Pauline and John were there and and they made me feel a part of. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you are. That's it. Okay. Yeah, Thank because you. mum, because you are a part of, you know, I think that a lot of adoptive parents, they can, you know, have this child now, and now this is their child, and the birth family doesn't matter, doesn't exist, but that's I not... think they need a, a, um, a, an award. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Matthew, <laughs> Pauline and John Ives need an award. <laughs> they do. Um, but on a serious note, it was, um, I was just excited. Mm. Um, I don't know what I was to expect. Yeah. Um, and one of the things, um, before we move on, um, I made sure I know that um, she said, what should I call you? Yeah. And yeah. I said, you can call me anything. Yeah. I didn't care, you know, because I wasn't there to say, I am your mum. I was just there to be there. Mm. I don't know. And yeah. not, not putting any expectations yeah. on myself and Shania or Pauline and John. Yeah. And I think that I found, I found that really helpful because for me leading up to the um, our, this reunion, I would, and I was saying to you the other day, I would watch this program on TV, Tracy Beaker. I don't know if anyone's heard of Tracy Beaker. And she she was um, given up by her birth mom and she was put in um, a children's home, which is called The Dumping Ground. And looking back on it, it's really terrible because it's, it, just, it really like glorified, glorified being in a children's home and glorified all of this kind of stuff. But when I was little, Tracy Beaker was really comforting to me because she, there was someone else like me out there that, you know, didn't have their birth mum. And she would talk about her birth mum and she would say, oh, my birth mum's a movie star and all of these, these kind of things. Um, and so I, I had that when I was little. So I was like, okay, I'm not the only one. And so leading up to the reunion, I, like I said, in childhood, I always felt that there was something missing. And so, and I think the reunion also is, it can be really framed as you meet your birth family and everything is wonderful everything everything is fixed everything is perfect everything is fine and so for me it was so interesting that I was so happy but it was so and I'm just looking at our faces there it was so weird to look at someone and I'm like I look like you and now even looking at you I look like you I'm looking at you yeah. it's like wow and it's, <laughs> we spent so but much time just being like, yeah because when we look back at us there yeah and like you can show someone the photo yeah. and they're smiling and all but when yeah. we left and said goodbye we all took pictures it was painful it was yeah like okay was, so what's next so what next that's it what next <laughs> because it's like we've met but we we're strangers we don't yeah. we don't know each other and so where do we go from here what what do we do from here you know um do i call you mum you feel like my mum i know that you are my mum but i have another mum and so that's why it really helped for you being like do you know what have the space to explore well what you've well what you've got to do in the time that you've got to do it so so yeah it was it I think was, that's important not to feel that for me not to feel that because I gave birth to you that makes me your mother and I feel that my eldest daughter she's now 35 I'm just gonna just yeah um I've done the same with her because being an addict I was out of her life as well but my mum had her so when I came back into um, into my daughter's life that my eldest one she didn't call me mum she didn't call me mum for a while um and I was like okay so she made this name up Marjay and she called me that for a while mm -hmm. and then one day we was walking down the road and she we were talking and she said mum and I thought right okay so I think the point is I'm making it I, I felt that for me it's important to allow I don't know, allow, yeah. um, not expect, yeah. because I'm yeah. that birth person. Mm. And that's it, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, it will come naturally. It yeah. will come. Um, I just, I don't know where I've got it from, but I've, I, it works. And yeah. It has worked. Yeah. And me and my eldest, we are what we like. <laughs> What's your sister like? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Such a really close relationship. Right. Yeah. But being able to have that time yes, to build that relationship. That's it, yeah. yeah. Like well authentically. Authent yeah. 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 Because I've, I realize that some people um, that have been separated, whether they're in prison, whether they're in rehab, whether they're in a mental place because they, 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 they have those sort of issues. But when you come in back into your child's life for whatever age, I believe that is to allow them that I just I really do mm, that space yeah yeah I'm passionate about that yeah yeah sorry yeah. if I went on a bit no, it's fine so um I'm gonna go on to the next slides hopefully my computer will go so the contact after our first our first reunion so after we met up in Brighton mm. 
then we kind of had we would speak on the phone and then sometimes I'd come up um, to see you because you're in London so I'd come from the east coast Brighton area to see you in London and see Shireen in London um, kind of building that relationship we weren't we didn't speak all the time mm -hmm. but I know that for example there was a time when um, I was a teenager and I was smoking a cigarette and my adopted mum she's really really strict on that stuff and I was smoking a cigarette walking down the road and then her car came down and <laughs> she stopped to let to give me a lift and she got all angry because I was smoking a cigarette I thought oh what am I gonna do and so I called you and I was like oh no and so during those times being a teenager kind of being able to have that contact and knowing that that you were there to be able to talk about about different things it was a kind of yeah it was I don't know how to explain the relationship it was it just was mm. I don't I don't know how to did to, you find that um to, to, to be able to call me just talk about those yeah being naughty yeah or was being not allowed to yeah. be that um and it made me feel like don't know the word as well it's a bit uh let me try my best it just made me feel good to be able to say right well i don't know what did what did i say i can't remember i think you anyway, probably down just yeah yeah um and and those are the things that mm. i found that helped me with shireen yeah with yourself yeah to just be there instead of being like well no i don't think we should go. Mm. Uh, you know mm. actually just um yeah just word. being able to be ourselves because yeah. I even find that now okay. in our reunion Thank now you. and I didn't I didn't put this in the presentation that there's certain things that my adoptive family wouldn't do that we were different in for example um they're very go 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 all the time right and not they don't have that element of relaxing right and so I find that I like to relax so if I'm on holiday I like I like to relax I'm insane, you know yeah. I like to just you know let's go for like a, a coffee this that whatever that is very me and gr growing up it was kind of like well you know why aren't I like them why am I like this is it lazy is it this is that whatever so now there's certain traits that I have that I see in you that I see in, in Dean my brother in Shireen and I'm like oh right. okay like and it's made me be able to just be more me. So I guess when we're talking about identity in reunion, um, yeah, it's allowed me to be, there's certain things where I'm like, okay, that's where I get that from. And then just be, allow myself yeah. to yeah. just be, be yeah. more who I am. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So we'll go on to the next slides. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's kind of <laughs> all over the place. Things are coming to us whilst we're speaking um so our second reunion what was this one um okay so our second reunion so the second reunion we, we were in reunion we were still talking and then it was I think around 2018 and um I was coming up to I was going to come up to university in London and so you came down um to Bexhill to, Bex Hill to speak to to um, my adopted mum dad about what was going to happen up there and I think the conversation really quickly turned into okay Shania's going to move up and move in with you so I think that that was it was a lot for us at the time we're just finding that out now really yeah really yeah yeah, yeah it was a lot for us because I moved up very quickly and we both weren't weren't ready it was like you're strangers you've kind of spoke here and there and now you're living together and you have to adapt to each other and it was just it just didn't it just didn't work yeah. it was a really painful experience yeah. I think it just it we didn't know where we were at we didn't know what, what we were doing um it was a lot of emotions mm. everything too quickly and then you had got to a point where you were like okay I can't do this anymore and then I had to go and so after that, after I had left, we didn't speak for what, like four years? Yeah, because I was just four now. Yeah. That's my granddaughter, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we didn't speak for four years, and I think that that was it was quite like traumatizing mm. for both of us. It was it was a lot. It was I was angry. Yeah, you were angry. I was angry. Um, her. Um, I went to therapy. I remember doing a bit of um. Um, therapy what's the one with emd something with the eye movement to the trauma memories and kind of 
because I had forgotten a lot of the things that had happened mm -hmm. on that last day, mm -hmm. right? And so kind of remembering them and I'd suppressed lots of memories, good memories, mm -hmm. as well oh, as bad memories, okay, right? And yeah, so after that, after we'd kind of gone our separate ways, keeping an eye on time, we've still got time. Um, yeah, so for the first few years, I was angry. I felt, you know, I felt I had come up and I had tried my best to, to fit in. It was difficult as well because um, Shireen and Dee, my brothers, and you had time together. And so I felt, okay, I felt I don't fit in with my adoptive family. You know, I do fit in, but I don't fit in mm -hmm. because there's certain things mm -hmm. where it's kind of like, okay, it's my family, but it's also, it's also not my family, even though it is, it's complicated. Um, and then I felt, wow, so I don't feel like, I don't feel like I fit in there, but then I also don't feel like I fit in with you guys because you guys have this relationship and then kind of feeling like, okay, I've been, I've been thrown out, um, all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, I was, there were in the early years, I wouldn't be able to talk about it without crying. I'd be really, really upset. I'd be, I was so angry. Um, I was like, I'm never going to speak to her again. I'm never going to speak to them again. But then also wondering, you know, are you thinking about me on my birthdays and this and that? So a lot of complex emotions around it. Um, and then, yeah, until I, I went into therapy and I did that therapy. I spoke through it with my therapist. Um, a lot I was I was so lucky to be able to have those those years of therapy um, on the adoption support fund um, and then I was able to get to a point where I was talking to my birth dad and I was he was kind of encouraging me you know Carol's still thinking about you etc etc and you should get in contact and then that's when that's when I think he gave you my number and then that's where we've been now but yeah what what was that time like like for you when, when you left um yeah i could see it now you know <laughs> right and yeah um i just didn't know what else to do um if it happened again mm. say for, for argument's sake i would do it differently mm -hmm. But then, I was at that stage, I just didn't know how to cope, mm. what to say. Because you said something, it's like, I'm this Shireen and Dean. Mm. And then it's like, okay, so we're here. Do you remember we had this little meeting mm. in, in my bedroom? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And I wanted Shireen and Dean to, to share their story yeah. about what they went through with me yeah. being, having an addictive mother, yeah. me. Yeah. And so you weren't the only one, Shania. But, mm. so, um, but when I think about it now... Mm. They were still with me and my mom and dad. Mm. I didn't look at it that you, how you felt like you were separated. You were not a part of. Yeah. So it showed that now looking back, I I, I really didn't. Um, it was too soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when the situation happened, it was like okay, right. When you've gone, you said oh, okay. She said that I'm. You said, I'm I, I said you're, you're dead, dead to me. me. I'm never going to speak to you again. <laughs> I thought, my gosh. Yeah. But what I done was um okay. So I'm dead at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said anyway. <laughs> right. But I know that I'm not going to stay dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um. At some stage, like the grace of the Almighty, it will work its way out. Um. Not for me to push it, force anything, or to blame. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yes, I was upset with um and Pauline and John, mm. but also. Pauline and John has played a big part in my life that um, I think I was allowed to be upset mm. yeah. with them, but also knowing that they were coming from a good place yeah, still yeah. because they're the best. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just left it and yeah. just um, and not to revert back to my old ways because that could have been a trigger. Yeah. For me to go and pick up and use, mm. and so I just just left it there mm. until when you got I heard of the contact through um, um your, your biological father and yeah. it's like okay so yeah, yeah. this is the time and yeah. everything happens at the time whatever the time that's meant to happen yeah which seems to be a, a kind of a big theme in our journey so could you imagine me relapsing yeah and then you coming, coming back, back. That, yeah do you see it just yes i'll give thanks yeah, yeah. okay yeah yeah and then I'm going to move on to the, okay. so then our third, our third reunion, which is where we are now, 
Um, and I love this picture so much. So yeah, I was going through therapy and, um, and time had passed. And what happened? I was, what was I thinking about? I was talking to my birth dad and I think I was asking him about, because all of my other sisters on my birth dad's side have like a million names. So this person's called this and this and that. So I was like, what is my, what are my other names? Because you named me Shania, um, but I don't, I was like, where is my other name? So I was speaking to him about that. And then speaking, we, we hadn't spoken about you, but then we started speaking about you and um yeah and wondering okay but is she thinking about me is this is that and he was saying yeah and so he gave you my number and I was still lucky at that point to have the support of my therapist as well um which was really good and I had the support of my partner and the support of my adoptive parents just just everyone which I'm very grateful for and then one day I got a call from you and um yeah you called me um yeah and so that was I think that was it was a lot for both of us mm -hmm. because it was just kind of that first connection and we didn't really say much but what I liked now now you've just brought it back to me that you said let's take it slowly yes and you said and before we actually met here yeah, um, person, you, yeah. you needed to write me a letter yeah with, um, um, and, and in the letter explaining everything that I had felt yeah during that time mm. because you had felt a lot and I had felt a lot and we spoke yes when we were speaking yesterday we were saying that we were feeling a lot but we didn't know how to put that in words or we couldn't recognize what those feelings were mm -hmm. um and so that's my my social worker and my my therapist had said you know write it down write it down in a letter write everything that you need to say and just be completely honest and my therapist I keep talking about my therapist I love her she's so great I miss her but um she had said to me a while back she said you know when you're having relationships whether it's with anyone honesty is is the most important like brutal honesty not not holding back to feel like okay I don't want to hurt you I don't want to mm. hurt this person but that brutal honesty and mm. so I was just so honest mm. in that letter and that was it was difficult because I was I didn't know how you would take it mm. I didn't know if I'd make you angry I didn't know if you would maybe not understand I was thinking if she doesn't understand then I don't think I'm going to be able to you know like re-enter reunion um, and hold okay. parts of myself back mm -hmm. um but yeah you took that really well how mm. was that for you um I just had to um, accept what you were saying. Mm. Um, I just had to take a bit, because you sent me through the email, that stuff, isn't it? And it's like, yeah. okay, yeah. right, this is how she felt. And I just had to, no, I didn't have to. Mm. Uh, it's just important for me to um, not have my guard up, but, okay. you know, um, what's she talking about? Mm. You know? And just think of myself. So I had to let that go. And once I let that go, yeah. then it enables me to think about or put myself in, no, not put myself in, but to more concentrate on how you felt mm. before coming up to meet you. Mm. And that helped me. Mm. Not to just, oh, you know, um, yeah, just thinking about how I felt. I was thinking about more how you felt. Mm. And I think that that's been really helpful for both of us because we both care a lot about each other's, you know, even in making this presentation, like you want to make sure I'm comfortable. I want to make sure you're comfortable. We both want to hear each other, um, which is, yeah, which is so, I think it's vital. So it's, and that, yeah, and so that honesty, yeah, yeah. being able to be, you know, honest with each other, you know, this doesn't make me comfortable or that doesn't make me comfortable. Which is, you're always both. asking me, yeah, if I'm comfortable with this or yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I appreciate that so yeah. much. Yeah, on, on both ends, because it's it's like we we have to, it's still very new. Mm. So we still mm. have to, to build. Mm. There's a lot, mm. we've got a lot further to go mm. to build our relationship. Mm. But I feel like now this time, we're kind of, the what's it called like the foundations are ah, stronger yes you know I mean? we didn't have enough foundation before that's why yeah there was no there was nothing yeah. there but big thanks that we were able to recognize that yeah to where we are now yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that the next slide is our advice. Um, so our advice to <sighs> everyone. <laughs> our advice to people who may be you know I guess birth parents um who may be going into reunion to adoptees going into reunion for me um I would say that I would say that reunion is hard apart I kind of want to take a sidestep right because first of all reunion isn't possible for all adoptees and you know even if birth parents are alive reunion you know might might not go well but for me what I really kind of took comfort in during our separation was like really kind of getting in contact with like my roots and my spiritual side and my ancestors and so I felt really really connected to myself by doing that so doing meditation mm -hmm. really coming home to myself mm -hmm. because I thought you know I'm not that's it's not I'm never gonna you know talk to my birth family again so um and I've been thinking about it recently kind of like you know if reunion doesn't go well if you, reunion isn't possible really kind of mm. coming home to ourselves because I think a lot of adoptees can feel like we don't have that home because we've lost our birth family mm -hmm. so that really really did help me like having building a strong like spiritual connection I know it's not for everyone but a strong spiritual connection with my ancestors mm -hmm. um yeah yeah mm -hmm. so that that really really helped as well but I would just say you know it's so important to like take your time to not expect anything to go through the motions like you know sometimes sometimes I'll feel rubbish um even if it's a joyful moment right less so now like when there's a time when we were all together yesterday for example oh, yeah. and I just felt good right I just felt good but there there was a time when we went shopping and we were with Shireen and you guys were so used to what you're doing and I was like Is oh we went to the Primark, yeah yeah oh, yeah right. and, oh, I, and I was okay. like oh you know I feel like I don't fit in but I was able to tell you you know and you were able to you know not take offense because you know I didn't want mm. to distance myself mm. because I'm feeling these things mm. and then for you to think oh well you know what's happening mm. so being able to you know be honest with each other and be like it's nothing it's just the process this is a process okay it's just the process it's, it's to feel the feelings yeah and to acknowledge them something like yeah, that yeah yeah and to know it's a feeling and yeah. from you can be honest mm. and i don't take it personally mm, mm, yeah then Definitely, yeah and you too as well mm -hmm. that's it like the complete the complete honesty mm. and because <laughs> i'll just say we're quite similar yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true so that's so, true. so yeah, yeah, you know yeah. there's there's things that we're finding that i'm getting this from you yeah so yeah. kind of feeling like we're very similar in that we you know it is we don't take offense because it's coming from a place of love yes. and building the relationship yes. so it just is what it is yes. you feel like that okay what can i do to mm. make you feel better do you need space mm -hmm. just recognizing each other's feelings yeah. and emo emotions yeah. and yeah yeah and, and 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 not being um um allowing yourself to have for me not to have my back up and you know mm. so I think that helps yeah. um, in yeah. in reunions and, and stuff like that. Yeah 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 it's okay. Yeah it's okay yeah. not to it's okay to feel rubbish and or certain emotions and mm. whatever have you. Yeah. It's it's all okay. Yeah Does that make sense? yeah completely yeah is there any other advice that you would give to like birth parents adoptive parents do you know I didn't realize that birth parents I didn't realize that I I didn't realize that I giving up uh, a child or having to have to give up a child or whatever you call it mm. um I, I just thought I was all right mm. and I'm the bad person mm. and I don't deserve you, you know because of mm. what I was putting you through putting myself through putting everybody else through mm. but um I feel the advice is just to um just to be honest with yourself um because when they say when the system says for whatever reason that we have to take this child mm. there's a reason mm. they're not just coming to take your child mm. they're just come and take you there's mm. a reason and now i'm able to look at 
the bigger picture. Mm. What, when the social worker says, well, my name is Christine Hascott and Shania's on the interim care order and, and she's looking at me like to maybe have a fight or have a, mm. and I'm thinking, what can I do? So mm. it's working, it's, this advice is to not be, um, um, the system is there to help in some ways. In some, in, ways, in, yeah. some, in some yeah, ways yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to, to catch that in but um, yeah. that what helped me what can I do what work can I put in because yeah. it's about that work because like I said they didn't come just to take you <laughs> away yeah, just I like that we were, quite, we were quite lucky because we had that kind of back and forth yes so this so was like they were working with 1999 me. they were working with yeah, me so is... Shania goes off there yeah and then she comes back to you then yeah. she goes off there and yeah. they build do you see what to me? So yeah. that's why I didn't feel as angry, but yeah. I felt angry with myself because I wasn't able to maintain myself okay. keeping clean. Yeah. So yeah. the point is, um, I can do that going off, is is just to um to to to, to be honest with oneself mm. about the situation, not because oh well, well, you know, I did this and I did that. Mm. You just got to be I found I was just honest with myself. Yeah, and that helped you. And it helped me. Yeah. That's my advice. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it. That's all we have. Thank you so much for listening to us. And thank you again um, to PAC for having us. Thank you, Shania. And thank you, Carol. That was just incredible. I'm almost lost for words there. That was oh, bless you. incredible to watch, to be honest with you. And, and honesty is the thing which really kind of shines through, actually. You're being honest with us, but you're also being really honest with each other. Uh, and the chat is full of people really acknowledging that and being very thankful about it. And you're really honest about the complexity of relationships. My goodness, they're so complicated, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and yet they have such potential. And I think that you've shown that by continuing to talk to each other. And uh, Carol, I loved the idea that you wanted to give an, an award to Pauline and John. That was amazing. And, uh, and I think there are adopters listening today, and I hope others who watch this recording who will uh, really listen to that and, and listen to, to the impact on both of you, which has been so positive. So, um, yeah, speak for everyone. Thanks so much. That was amazing. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce this afternoon Liz Wilde, who's a really experienced life coach and, um, and thinker about adoption. And uh, she's going to thankfully share our thoughts, her thoughts with us. So over to you, Liz. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everyone. What fantastic presentations we've seen and heard uh, today so far. Absolutely wonderfully, wonderful for me to be part of this community. So thanks, Mike, for inviting me. I'm a newbie. So today I'm going to show you how my, I created my identity through the stories I told myself growing up as an adoptee. How it was my interpretation of events, far more than the actual events themselves which shaped who I thought I needed to be to stay safe in this world. We all do this. The world is literally what we think it is. We are, we are all creating our experience of life with our thinking moment to moment. I also want to show you how it's never too late to change the story. I have some questions at the end of my talk that will hopefully inspire you to challenge your own interpretations, have a, another look at your own stories. So please have a pen and paper handy or your phone. Uh, and Mike is also gonna put them in the chat. So let's go back to 1969. I'm showing my age, aren't I? I was six years old when I was first told that I was adopted. So I can remember the scene so, so well, sitting in my pink flowery bedroom on my mum's knee on the wicker chair when she told me that my real mum had been unable to keep me. Now, I would never use the term real mum now, but I'm sure that that was the term that my mum used way back then. So how terrified was I in that moment? Absolutely terrified. Everything that I'd taken for granted had suddenly disappeared. I, I can put myself back now to that very moment. My interpretation of what my mum said, the story I told myself was, 
If my mother had been able to give me away, how much easier would it be for these strangers? It would only be a matter of time before these new parents of mine would do the same. You know, when our minds are insecure, we always go to the negative, don't we? We always go to the painful. So not surprisingly, I've developed quite a healthy fear of abandonment. I remember when I went to, this is obviously when I was there young, I'd go to infant school, my mum would drop me off at the door and I would make her promise she'd be standing in the exact same spot when I came out. She couldn't even be further down the hall. She had to be in exact same spot. And if I ran out the door and she wasn't there just for a moment, my heart would just turn over. I also remember uh, being in floods of tears when my mum and dad left me at brownie camp, taking it as a, an absolute sense of abandonment. When they came back to pick me up, I actually don't think I talked for them, to them for about two days. I also remember sobbing when I was left at a Sunday school, just them walking out the door and leaving me somewhere else was just the end of the world. So that was the story that I had. But what I didn't see, of course, was that my adopted parents really wanted children. They wanted me very, very much. So why on earth would they have given me back, had given me away, whatever I thought, would walk out the door and never come back? Why on earth would they do that? So moving on to growing up. Adoption was never mentioned at home. You know, it's, it's the big secret, wasn't it? The big secret to be kept at all costs. I have another very strong memory of walking along the road with my father and a friend of the family said, obviously not that close a friend, but a, a, a friend of the family said to my dad, oh, hasn't she got beautiful eyes? And my dad said, quick as a flash, yes, she takes after my wife. And I looked at my dad, I was totally confused because, of course, I'd been brought up to be told not to lie, to never tell a lie. And I thought, but that's not true, Dad. But it was not even mentioned. We just carried on walking down the road as though nothing had happened. I was also terrified of exposure. So my colouring was a lot darker than my parents. Actually, my adopted mum had red hair and glasses, so she couldn't be more different from me. My dad had brown hair. And I remember at school, people would say, you've got black hair. And I'd say, no, 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 it's brown. Because I felt that my cover would be blown if people could see that my colouring was different to my parents, that I didn't look like my parents. Now, I didn't know anyone else who was adopted, anyone. And I felt very different from all my friends. And the story I came up with that with for that was that I am the only child whose mother has given her away, given them away, the only child. It's happened to no one else. And because of that, I thought to myself, no one must ever know this shameful secret. Now, what I didn't see, well, I didn't see that my parents were protecting themselves by not telling anyone, by keeping this, this under wraps. They didn't want anyone to know that they had been unable to have children of their own. It had nothing to do with me. It was no failing on my part. And also what I didn't see was the comments about my coloring, coloring were compliments. I didn't see that either. So teenage angsty years, we all have those, don't we? I very much felt like an outsider like I didn't belong, as, as I've heard today already. It's common, obviously, very, very common. And also common, I've heard today, is I didn't feel like I could trust the bond with my adopted parents. So I pushed back to try and prove myself right. I had lots and lots of horrendous arguments with my father. He was very strong-willed, and I believe I was probably rather strong-willed myself. Uh, yeah, so a pretty horrendous time, actually, a lot of the time. I remember 
at the age of, it was 13, I'm sure. And after a particularly bad row with my father, I was walking to my friend's house, obviously in a very low mood. And I suddenly had the thought, and again, I can remember the, the road I was walking and I can remember exactly where I was. You know, these, these memories are just right in there, aren't they, forever? And I thought to myself, if my own mother didn't want me, I must be a terrible person. Now, that wasn't a very comfortable thought to have at the age of 13 and, and later, obviously. So what didn't I see? That was my story. That was my painful story. What didn't I see? And what I didn't see because I didn't know, had no idea, was the adoption practices of the 1950s, 60s, even 70s. The pressure on unmarried women to have their child adopted by a two-parent family. It was best for the child, considered best for the child. I had no idea of any of that, not a clue. So during this time, my scared young mind created a subconscious survival strategy. I wanted to feel safe and secure, so I came up with a master plan. And my master plan was this. No one was ever going to have power over my life again. Because the way I saw it, no one had asked me who I wanted to live with. This huge life-changing decision had been made without any uh, thought to ask me. So no one was ever going to have that power over my life again. So what did this look like? This looked like I had to be 100% independent, both emotionally, which meant I needed total freedom, no marriage and no children. And also financially, I was, uh, I was um, saving my birthday money into a little post office account from a very, very young age because I believed I had to be self-sufficient. No one was ever going to make decisions for me again. I had created an identity who I thought I needed to be to stay safe. So moving on, I started searching as soon as I possibly could at the age of 18. Now, we all know practices were very different then. The social worker gave me very basic information, uh, essentially my original name and place of birth and my mother's, my natural mother's name and her place of birth, really hardly anything else. And these basics were just so I could start searching through the huge birth, death and marriage ledgers at St. Catherine's, Dock, St. Catherine's House sorry, in London, looking for any reference for my natural mother. I was told nothing about the story behind my adoption, certainly nothing about the sad circumstances behind why my mother had to give me away. And I think even today, how much earlier I could have rewritten my painful story, story if I'd known, if I'd known the facts back then when I was 18. But unfortunately, the story I still believed was that my mother had given me up willingly. And what I didn't know, because I wasn't allowed to know, was the truth. So let's pause for a moment to see what was going on in my mind during this time. I often say to clients, what the thinker thinks, the prover proves. I believed I'd been unwanted, that something was wrong with me and my brain looked for evidence every day to support that belief. It's confirmation bias, right? Our brains love to make us right. So every argument with my parents, what did I make it mean? You don't want me, you don't love me. Every disloyalty, every hurt with friends, family, boyfriends, teachers, a reason to believe my story more, a reason to dig in. I saw the world through the filter of my insecure thinking, and boy, did I construct some high protective walls, which weren't very easy to live behind either. 
So aged 40, I began a two year training program to become a life coach. I'd been working in women's magazines for most of my adult life. And I was always someone that my friends came to for advice with their problems. I was fascinated by how our minds work, not, not just, not least of all mine, because I was bored of my self-protection, of pretending I didn't need anyone and people believing me. <laughs> hey, I thought, you know, there must be an easier way. So early on in my trading, I read a book and the book asked me a question. Which of these words would you most hate people to think about you? And the options were stupid, weak, lazy, incompetent. And the word that literally jumped out of the page at me was rejected. I had never articulated that word before, and it had such a potent sting. The thought that anyone could think that of me was horrendous, was, was terrible. So part of my training to become a life coach is I had, I had coaching myself. And I approached my first, co first coaching session saying to my new coach, I think my problems stem from being rejected as a baby. And this coach was very wise and she was able to distance me from my pain, painful story for the first time. And she said to me, you were never rejected. The decision was made before you were even born. How could you be rejected, she said, if you didn't even exist? Well, that was nothing short of a revelation, I can assure you. Because for the first time, I thought, maybe it's not about me. And if it's not about me, do I have to be ashamed anymore? Is this such a shameful secret anymore? I felt stronger uh, around this time. So I pushed to see my adoption file. And for the first time, I soon saw the true story. Far from being rejected, my mother had fought to keep me. There were letters in my adoption file describing her torment at being parted from her. She actually put off signing the adoption papers for nine long months as she tried to find a way to keep me. There were also letters in the file from the adoption agency to my natural mother detailing my parents, my adopted parents' distress while they waited to hear from her. So here was a true story. I was wanted very much by both my natural mother and my adopted parents. You know, this was no longer a shameful secret. I didn't feel rejected anymore. And something else, maybe even this was something to be proud of, that these, all these people had wanted me. So I managed to wrestle uh, some letters and photos from my file from the social worker. It, was, it wasn't easy, but I managed to get some. And I made a collage and I put them on my wall to remind myself every day of how much I'd been loved. Years later, I tracked down my Spanish father's family, so hence the dark hair. My mother had met him while she was staying with her parents who owned a bar in Benidorm. He was separated from his wife, but was unable to get a divorce in 1960s Catholic Spain. they had lived together. And when my mother fell pregnant, she came back to England to give birth to me to avoid a scandal. My father had expected her return to return to Spain with me. Instead, I learned for the first time that my grandmother, my natural mother's mother, had told him that I died soon after being born. They had believed that it was best that if he couldn't marry her, she could start again. 
My father died young in a car accident, so I was never able to meet him. But my cousin's husband, who had been good friends with him, told, told me, if he'd known you had survived, oh, this always gets me, he would have traveled the world to find you. Hmm. Actually, let me just take a sip of this. So this was a part of the true story that I hadn't even considered that my, my natural father had wanted me. That just really didn't fit with the story I'd been telling myself, that he was the, the bad deserter in this. So the first step for changing the script in my head was I began to dismantle all the insecure stories I'd believed over the years and instead focused on the reality I now knew. I did this by writing on post-it notes. I was never rejected. I was wanted very much and I stuck them all around the house. So I would be reading them constantly. This was to rewire my subconscious survival strategies because it felt very much now like maybe I didn't have to protect myself so much. And as we all know, protecting ourselves can be such hard work. Soon after my adoptive mother died, we'd always been an undemonstrative family. And I was able to tell her for the first time as she lay unresponsive in bed. It was two days before she died. I was able to say to her, I was so glad you were my mother. Oh, that was, that still gets me as well. And she opened her eyes and big smile on her face. She always had a big smile. And she just asked me why. And then her eyes closed and she went back to being in unresponsive. But I was able to tell her for the first time. And I'm so glad of that. After her death, my adoptive fam father opened up a little more about my adoption as well, as, as I said before, never, never mentioned. And he told me that after I'd been handed over to my mum and him in the adoption agency, they were in a room and my natural mother had fought to get her to get herself back into the room so that she could take me back. And she'd had to be physically restrained. From, from grabbing me out of my mum's, my new mother's arms. So the full story, full true story at last, was that I had absolutely no doubt in my mind anymore that either my natural parents had wanted me, sorry, either my natural parents had given me up willing, I, willingly, I should have said, or that my adopted parents had wanted me very much. So step two to challenging my story. During my 20 years of plus actually of life coaching, I've remained fascinated with how our minds work and I'm always keen to learn more. Five years ago, I discovered what is often referred to as the inside out understanding, which has now totally changed how I see my own life and has also changed how I coach my clients. At its core is the principle that our experience of life is created by our thoughts moment to moment. We are literally creating our reality with our thinking, which is why one day a situation can, can seem impossible and the next day can feel completely different. The situation hasn't changed, but our thoughts about it have. We've been conditioned to believe that what we see out there is objective reality, when really we're all viewing the world through our own thought systems. All the data we've hoovered up over the years and now believe to be true. Like wearing a pair of 3D goggles, we live in a world of our own backstory. So our memories, our interpretations, our perceptions, our conditioning, we see what we expect to see. I put on my rejection goggles and that's what I saw. I put on my 
I wasn't wanted goggles. And I saw evidence every day that I was right. I now help clients to see through their own stories, to question the reality they've created, to question the labels they've given themselves, and to question the childhood survival strategies that are always way out of date. I want to leave you with some questions today to start the process for yourself. So please write them down or refer back to the chat later. So the first question is, what's a painful story you created long ago that has looked more and more real to you as you collected evidence over the years to support it? Revisit this story. Is it still accurate? Is it still relevant? Is it even true? How would your life be different without this story? What else is possible? Might an alternative story give you a better life? My second question. I'm probably speaking a bit too quick, can't I? Can you identify one of the survival strategies your own mind came up with when you were young? like my 100% independent story. A strategy that was designed to help you feel safe and avoid discomfort. I had a client last week who was moving into management and felt scared that people wouldn't like her if she had to make difficult decisions if she had to stop being everyone's friend. She went to a ferocious girls boarding school from a very young age. And basically you were either popular or your life was a living nightmare. She had no idea, but she had the belief in her head, I have to be liked or something terrible will happen. This was totally subconscious. And when we discovered this on our session, she cried. She had no idea that she'd been holding this back and holding on to the memories that, you know, as a young child, were so terrifying for her. But once she saw where this came from, she could also see that it was no longer relevant to the present day. She was an adult now. She wasn't a child away from her family in a very scary place. And she was able to drop the fear and feel much better about moving into her managerial position. So my second part of my second question is, how does this strategy, excuse me, how does this strategy still play out in your life today? And importantly, what is it costing you? There's a wonderful quote by Janet Malcolm, an American author. We go through life mishearing and misseeing and misunderstanding. So the stories we tell ourselves will add up. We all have our own way of punching ourselves in the head, of hurting ourselves with our own fear-based thinking. We've learned to interpret this thinking as if it was reality, but we forget we're the ones who are actually doing the thinking. It's like a child drawing a picture of a monster and then running out of the door screaming. 
We're all weebling along in our own separate realities, innocently mistaking our thoughts for the truth. We then live in the feeling of our thinking and cause ourselves so much unnecessary pain and suffering. It's not that tragedies don't happen, but it's what we make of them that create our experience of life. Most importantly, what we make them mean about ourselves. I hope I've got you curious about your own stories today and how they might not be true, especially if they were created from an insecure state of mind. When my clients see through their own stories and strategies, their lives get so much easier. So please do spend some time reflecting on my questions. One more thing I'd love to leave you with. I'd love you to start noticing how your thoughts are creating your experience of life moment to moment. It really is a game changer. It has certainly changed my life completely. And I see it every day with my clients. Because once you see this, you can also see that all it takes is a new thought to create a different experience, to create a far kinder story, to give you a fresh start. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And thanks, Mike, for inviting me. Liz, that was fantastic. Thank you. That's so thought provoking. I mean, that's such an interesting way to look at things. And uh, the chat has been a buzz. Uh, and in the chat, I've put the, um, uh, the questions. So adopted or not, you can go away, and consider those questions and consider your life because there's a lot of wisdom and interest in there. That was, that was just great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank sharing you your own story i mean adoption really is full of stories isn't it there's no two ways about it we all have stories we have files we have things that different participants in our lives birth family adopted family have told us and they all fit together into these funny meshes and you can change them now we discover which is just great <laughs> thank you all so much thank you thank you right i'm going to move on because we we're uh, we uh, yeah we need to move on uh, we, I'm going to move to my colleague Tanya Killick, who's actually just downstairs in our Leeds office here with some uh, some young people from um, the, uh, well, she can explain. So uh, are, you, are you there, Tanya? Over to you. Sorry, the technical <laughs> bit there. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear us. We've got a very fancy camera, which is wide angle, so you can fit us all in because we want it to be in person to do this. <laughs> We've also got a very fancy microphone, so hopefully we should be clear as a whistle. Um, yeah, we've been here all day watching this, and as you've, we've had our camera on in, in your session, Liz Wild, and, and, and everything that's been talked about has just, just sparked so many conversations. Yeah, awesome. So I feel like I've, we've talked <laughs> endlessly awesome. today about adoption, but, but like I feel like I've also missed loads of stuff, so I'm going to be re-watching a lot because, yeah. yeah, it's been full on. So we'll try and focus back in because um yeah it's yeah it's been all over the place and very very moving day so far um so yeah hi I'm um Tanya Killick and I run the Adoptings Project at PAC UK and I also run <laughs> the Fill in the Gap Project which is a group that we set up oof, over a year ago now Definitely. I think it's last September it got delayed a bit by Covid and that was a group that we set up for adopted adults but for young adopted adults so from 18 to 25 because we it's called fill in the gap because there is a massive gap there for adults at this age um because as we know the adoption spot fund drops off at 21 25 if you've got additional needs but that's a, a small percentage of people and it doesn't also the adoption support fund doesn't really cover groups in this sense so yeah we set this up with the support of one adoption thank you very much and uh it had 10 spaces it dwindled down to about seven and and now we've got a core four um two of who are here today and you might if you've watched the adopted for life film that we did last year recognize these beautiful faces sat here with me on the sofa so we've got jamal it's me. Yes. And we've got JP. Why did you scoff at the beautiful? No, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, so, yeah, so our kind of remit today was to 
talk about some of the because the filling the gap group really was um just bringing adopted adults together with myself Gaynor and Joe Mitchell who who heads up PAC UK now as the national lead to just really come together and talk about the many different ways that adoption affects us and especially as young adults um coming into the world you know you're leaving behind the teenage years and trying to figure out who you are in the world when you're right you know already grappling with identity and lots of other issues so we kind of thought it would be a safe space yeah to talk about the many ways in which adoption affects us and that has mostly been about relationships because that's how it impacts us the most you know you know it's about how it's impacted relationship with others relationships with the world and relationships with ourselves really and that identity so we thought that it's brought up so many themes I, I can't begin to tell every week it's you, you just never know where it's heading you might be talking about you know moving out of house moving job rela relationships with girlfriends to then talking about school and college and lack of support and anger at the system and lack of choice you know it's all over the place but I thought I'd pick up on some of the more unusual ones that maybe don't get talked about in the wider world of adoption so it's it's yeah I think that's the best way to describe yeah. what we're maybe <laughs> going to talk about today um and um yeah so I thought that one of the one of the really interesting subjects that that came out of the discussion one week and the multiple weeks actually when we met was how the age of adopters um has impacted all four of the young adults that were in the group um and which isn't you know there's no upper age limit on um adopters when they're recruited and it was a really interesting conversation from everyone about how it has impacted them as as young people how it's impacted them as you know small children as teenagers and you know it impacts them when they're thinking about the future so I'm gonna kind of hand over to you guys to maybe talk a bit about how you know what age were were your um adoptive parents when they adopted you do you want to go first or shall I I don't mind I'll go so I was adopted at three years old um both my mothers were mm, let me see if I can get this right <laughs> <laughs> mid 40s later um and which meant for me growing up there was a lot less of the like active play and stuff like that and it was a lot more uh what I would call intelligent play so a lot of board games cards things that weren't too strenuous and stuff like that but it was um it did form a large part of my identity because it forced me as a young person to kind of mature up a little bit and have more adult conversations and more adult activities at a younger age because it didn't give me enough the space to really be full infantile again but I think that was for me was perfect I don't know about you similar to you I but my um my adopted mother was a single mother there was no other parent in the house um she's quite old now I'd say when she adopted me she was in her late 40s she's now pushing towards the 70s so yeah it's a it's a big age big age gap and like you I say I missed out on probably more child good mm. memories a bit like um playing hide and seek um more rough and tumble um yeah that was my cousins <laughs> maybe like just going to a um a park and having them actually engage with you it's more like oh I'll sit here on this bench you go ahead though I'm watching you mm. you oh, know wow. it wasn't very yeah, I remember one of you saying, like, you always felt a little bit envious of the kids in the park, like mm. where their parents were chasing them around, or they were really, I can't remember who of you said it, but that I really, really mm. resonated with me, because I've got a toddler at the moment, and that's all I ever do. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> but I think then on the flip side of that, it uh, helped me, because they were so stable in their identity and who they were because they'd lived longer in their lives and kind of had that groundwork there and had the foundations for their own life it meant that 
they weren't struggling, they weren't unsure, they weren't questioning their lives and it didn't rub off on me as much as say someone who's a young adoptive parent who may not have been quite so complete in their story, do you know what I mean? But uh, it did help me to find my identity through conversation, through being, through their security in themselves, mm. it kind of brought me out of my shell quite a bit because I, well, I was furthest thing from secure, do you know what I mean? But mm. um, yeah, it is a bit of a, two sides of a coin. I mean, you've got bits of elements that can be good, some that can be negative, but I think it would well, personally for me, uh, living in a white household as a mixed race person, it did give me the tools to find myself in a way that was healthy rather than just take stimulant from the environment, do you know what mm. I mean? And create my own story and just go off the rails. So. What about in the teenage years? Oh, <laughs> the teenage years. Um, that very different story. That I mean, that's what to about nine. For me, my teenage years were particularly awful as I had a very la large lack of identity. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, growing up in a completely white household as a mixed race child, it's obviously going to bring up some identity questions and why. Uh, so, I mean, I didn't have the luxury of not talking about my adoption or my parents not talking about my adoption because it was obvious from the get-go. I mean, two white women with a black child with an afro, do you know what I mean? It's 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 there. It's you know what's happened, do you know what I mean? Um so yeah, my teenage years it was a lot of distance to my parents, to be honest, because I just didn't relate to them, didn't look like them, didn't feel part of it. So it's just a lot of isolation. Mm. Yeah. And what about you in your teenage years? I just about think... your mum's age. Thinking about your mum's keeping it out, thinking about your mum's age. How did that I just think I was raised maybe a little bit old schoolish <laughs> in a way. I was very much a latchkey kid, which is don't think is very well, as often nowadays. I'm not sure. Might be wrong. But yeah. I just think it was very different sort of parenting style to mm. like what I would maybe give my child today, but yeah. Explain that a little bit more. I think it's just different generations raise their children differently. It's, differently. it's a lot. We were just saying about values. stiff upper lips, keeping yourself to yourself. Your emotions are your emotions not someone else's emotions don't burden your problems to someone else you you can deal with it do you know what i mean it's it's your problem do you know what i mean whereas nowadays i'd i'd encourage my kid to share absolutely all the problems and help me a problem shared as a problem half mm -hmm. do you know what i mean i think if we were to become parents now we'd definitely look after kids differently to how we were mm -hmm. looked after i think yeah Maybe that's because of the age gap. I don't know. Maybe it's just because we're different people to the ones who raised us. I don't know. I think but, it's yeah. probably a multi, multiple multi factors, isn't it? All combining, but yeah. Yeah, and that's about, my two cents. What about thinking about the future? You know, you've got parents who are what in there? Is your yeah, um, approaching 70, 70 now 70. in their 70s and I'm 24 now. So I'm just about to try and leap off into the great wide world but I've got this kind of thing of uh, I kind of want to stay around make sure they're all right do you know what I mean I kind of want to make sure I spend them last few good years <laughs> as dark as it sounds do you know what I mean I want to spend it say if my mum's only got five years left two years one year left I want to spend it with her because I finally feel like I'm getting that love do you know what I mean at 24 I wish I could felt that at three but um, I kind of don't want to waste that now. Do you know what I mean? I want to capitalise on it and make the most of it. But it's like, you, you feel that clock. You know that clock's ticking. You know that they're getting on. You ain't got much time. So you got to make the most of it. So I mm -hmm. guess it puts that pressure on. And it did put the pressure on me to make the relationship with my parents, well, adoptive parents, better than it was because I knew it wouldn't last forever already as a young kid. I knew that that, that moment of having to say goodbye or losing them out of the blue is closer than I would like it to be. 
Do you know what I mean? think that was you just knew it? Like, oh, I just knew it instinctively. Like, I mean, yeah. yeah, you just know it's it's there. And luckily, it didn't happen while I was growing up. But the fear was always there of because I, I and again, one of my parents is disabled as well. Um, so I mean, you, you just think to yourself, oh, I mean, what well, she she slips on something or falls down or you know what I mean it goes it goes through your head you start panicking I think it was mentioned by one of the other speakers that the the worst case scenario is always going through your head I'm ready for that abandonment I'm ready for them to disappear I'm ready for them to disappear um and it just the for me the age kind of enhanced that yes do you know what I mean it enhanced that fear of maybe they won't be around as long as I'd like them to be, do you know what I mean? So, I mean, and I, I, that's lucky because I had a good re relationship by the end, well, nowadays with my parents, but yeah, the fear is always there, definitely. Is there anything else you want to say on that, Jerry? Um, no, I got all <laughs> caught up in what you were saying. <laughs> no, no. Oh, once I start waffling, I start going. <laughs> no, I think it left. I just want to add to that because I was very conscious of it. My parents adopted me when I was four. When they when I was four, so I'm not forty yet, so that would not work. But and when they were forty, and I think you've just said something that I've just had a realization of actually that mm. yeah, I think I always, apart from the fact that my dad told me that he was going to die, he always pre he prepped me because yeah, of heart yeah, yeah, and he prepped me from like being like late teens to he passed away five years ago, but um. And it really, you know, it, I brought it, I used to sit on a panel where I approved adopters and I raised it as, cause it's always been there and I know it's a thing for me. But, and so it's been really enlightening talking to other adopted adults. When you raised it, I was like, yeah, I always thought that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's one of the ones you don't think about. As a, as a kind of, hang on, you know, we're always kind of, we've come from a place of loss and to have that, I'm not saying it's complex, isn't it? It's, it's a really complex. complex issue, but there is always that thing about, you know, losing a parent when you're young as an adopted person, mm. as another. Because I always say, if I had lost one of my mums at that time, I would have broken me completely. Mm. I don't think I would have coped at all. Yeah, and I just, I don't know how much it's the adoptee perspective on that issue is brought in really mm. know, that's why i found it so fascinating to talk to you guys about it and but again really it's that um, interesting to hear what's been talked about on the chat because i just can't read <laughs> anything <laughs> look at, at this moment, chat real quick so. <laughs> um yeah yeah um, but i do think on the flip side it because I, I was quite a difficulty at, at my adopted age as some in this call may know um <laughs> and I do think that that life experience was something that I did need from my parents. Mm. They knew how to deal with the behaviour. They knew how to deal with the difficulties, the mental health, the... Yeah, and then being a young adult and then being, what, now completely retired. They've got all the time in the world for me. It's great. <laughs> I just have to say, though, on the flip side of that, mm. my adopted mother was not at all prepared for mm. the slightest for any of the challenges she was going to get with me it, it, it's the specific yes and, and yeah. this leads I me on nicely to the next bit because one of the things we've talked about a lot and it was a shock to some of the the adults in the in the group that you know the six month assessment time too short yeah. <laughs> and um oh yeah skip that i don't want my computer shutting down <laughs> in the middle of this um yeah, you were all really, really, I don't know if some of you knew and some of you didn't, but I knew yeah. there was a bit of shock in the room when you I mean, I knew was... and it still shocks me here. Yeah. It should be the same term as a pregnancy. Because that's what it is, you're getting a child out of it at the end of it. Yeah, six months to become Too an adoptive short. parent is, well, yeah, it's shorter than a pregnancy. And, I mean, come on. I <laughs> <laughs> Like it's, it's, uh, Christmas for life. I mean, I mean, I even think a nine-month period would be too short to prepare someone for the potential traumas, potential heartache, loss. I'm basic understanding that you're gonna need. Yeah, I mean, how do you tell someone you are 
<laughs> put it in no cotton candy terms, you are accepting a very broken person into your home. Like, um, how can you learn to deal with that in six months? Pregnancy is nine months. That's a perfectly well kid. You know what I mean? And parents struggle after a nine month pregnancy. How do you expect an adoptive parent to hit the ground running after six months of Right, they're going to be a bit worried. They might have a bit of anxiety. They might, and this is what you need to do in this situation. Give us a call if it goes wrong. It's a bit of a laugh. <laughs> so I suppose what you're saying earlier is that because your parents were older, they did have a bit more grounding. Yeah. Maybe they had done gone to therapy themselves. I don't know. I'm just mm -hmm. you know throwing that out there. So many old people have possibly done that yeah. so they were a bit more because they had that age and that wisdom i suppose behind them it did help because the adoption process was so short they yeah. didn't get it through that um, but i mean even then i'd still say you know, a, a good 10 i mean what, how old am i 24 years minus three there was still 21 years of learning on the job <laughs> do you know what i mean so i don't know it's i think I think it's what you were saying earlier. I think some form of lengthening, a little bit of therapy for the prospective parents. I just, yeah, it, it just needs a bit more groundwork and more of an understanding on the adopters and the adoptees side of what's about to happen because it just seems all quite played down. I mean, you look at the your leaflets and your campaigns and all of this and it is all quite played down how serious these situations are going to be and I mean yeah and I think you've both spoke to me about how you felt sometimes you've had to deal with some of your pet your some of your parents issues have been and that happened oh yeah it, it happens, happens in every families. family you know parents project stuff onto you from their own own stuff but I suppose what you've said is that it's more complicated, you know, as an adopted person mm. having to deal with some of that stuff. Am I making sense? Mm. Yeah. You were saying like, you know, I, d I don't need your baggage. I need you to be able to parent me. And actually, I think you've both in your, you know, your families have, it, have kind of had some of that experience. And yeah. It's been really quite difficult to manage at times. Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> And I also think that the going back to just down on that with the um, the certain ages, um, prospective adopters being in certain age groups. Also, one thing I would also say is there needs to be background checks into the adoptee adopters, the would be adopters, for things like a, about religion and certain health, long-standing health conditions. Yes, certain. One. Yeah, these questions need to be answered because I am very unreligious. So putting me in a very religious household is not going to Yeah, religion's been an interesting topic, another really interesting topic that we've talked about because there's been a, a few parents that have um, been highly religious. And but it's like these big things that are quite, quite big, like your faith is a massive part of your identity. They yeah. need to be looked at mm. and taken into consideration. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, I can see the difficulty in uh, trying to place someone when the, ad the identity has not yet formed. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yes. It's, it's trying to predict an identity that's not yet there. And I can see the difficulty in that. I can see how it would present problems. And I, yeah, I love that comment right there. It's just, just, just flashed up. Children, I think that's the bottom line. It's the loving family that's the most important. Aspect. Sorry, my shoulder is absolutely killing me. Um, it's a very important aspect. And I think that's what I've realised in my life. Bottom line, it didn't matter the age of my parents because they absolutely loved the crap out of me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> I'm glad Josh did. <laughs> I'm going to switch track a bit now and I'm going to talk about the importance of school and the relationships that you have within school because that doesn't, I don't, again, I mean, school is talked about, but I think in terms of the impact of what a good relationship and a bad relationship with teachers and pupils, fellow pupils, but we'll hit on teachers first can have on you because it's such a massive yeah. part of your life isn't it going to school yeah. every single day 
and um you know we've had some really lively discussions around you know mainly about the poor relationships within school that you've had um but also about the importance schools. of schools <laughs> um of sometimes that one key person and how they can make a bit of difference do, do you want to always oh yeah Oh, I, I took lead on the last one, go for it. <laughs> well, I just always think that sometimes if you don't come from the greatest home life, you go to school, that, that might be the only smiley face you see in a day. That one teacher at school or that one friend you have at school, that might be the only place where you're actually being seen for actually who you are. So I think school can be a massive, massive part of your life, especially for me, because I needed a lot of I don't know, tutoring on the side in mm. school. I needed a little bit more help focusing for my attention, with behaviour, stuff like that. Engaging with other people. Mm. So for me, it was vital that I had help in school. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely yeah. vital for me. I feel like, well, for my, my school journey, I think I got quite lucky in that my, as well, leaving primary school in high school, my head of year had a background in social work so obviously in year seven said nothing most way through year eight said nothing and then incident happened won't go into it but it ended up with my adopted mum having to go in and explain to my head of year what was happening why i was the way i was and all that stuff and the level of understanding from just her I've made that very, very clear. It was just her that had this level of understanding. And it really did help. Uh, unfortunately, she ended up passing away about a year later. <laughs> um, and I was just left with the whole, every member of staff in school knowing, head teachers knowing, deputy head teachers knowing, um, and them basically just sending a memo around the whole school um, to all the teachers in which some teachers were pretty laid back about it, didn't really make a thing, didn't even want to pull me aside and talk to me about it. And some teachers just announced it in front of the whole class, do you know what I mean? So it's, I think, a bit of sensitivity, a little bit of... Um, knowledge on the subject uh because i mean and how did that how did that impact you um that impacted me in that i mean what goes to details but it's i mean bullying of course occurred um and then obviously having lesbian parents and all another factor on top of that um and yeah, it impacted my learning because I just wasn't asked anymore. I couldn't be bothered being in that room, dealing with the comments to then have to be asked to sit and listen to a teacher go on about pie. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, all I was thinking of is when is home time? When can I just get out of this room dealing with all of this? And, and then obviously comments stop. Everyone gets on with their lives. But you do always feel like, you're different you're segmented away from everyone else there's something about you that's making people look at you differently and it makes your learning difficult and then you get teachers that start excusing you and just go oh it's just because he's adopted i get labeled yeah, yeah it's, oh, it's, it's like, like exactly oh it's just because he's adopted he's not oh it's like you forget your homework one time and they'll just completely excuse you and what i mean realistically what habits is that going to set me for one later in life and two, it's making me out to be a problem that needs to be excused because I'm adopted. And I'm not a problem that needs to be excused. I'm not a problem that needs to be fixed. I'm just me and I'm trying to deal with it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I think for me personally, schools are one of the worst sites for an adopted person. Um... And I think that is one of the biggest things for me personally that I want to act upon and change. Mm. Quite, quite hard, mm. to be honest. And and the Adoptees Youth Council group as well. Yeah. Uh, because they're in the thick of it right now. Yeah. And, and very much that's where they're at. It's all about school. Yeah. And exactly, you know, they would sit here and talk for days about the ways that 
um, the relationships with their teachers and their peers impacts them as an adopted person yeah. because they are not understood. Yeah. Um, and everybody's experience is unique and they want, you know, we want to be treated yeah. like that rather than blanket policies and blanket policies, got all of them. Um, but yeah, I mean you were you were talking, JP, you had lots of really negative experiences with teachers in school. Um, but you did you have one really you're like, oh they, you know, they were mad. Yeah. Yeah. I had one teacher, she would go above and beyond, she'd wait after school with me just to make sure I got in the car home safe. Sometimes if I was down, she'd be like, we're not doing maths for the next half an hour. You're coming with me, we'll go to the sensory room, tea, biscuit, talk about stuff. And then I'd realise, oh, this was actually the reason why I was in such a horrific mood. Now I can go to work, be productive, be yeah. in a better mood, not yeah. distract half of my other classmates. Yeah. She's not an attention seeker, you know, but she was, it was her picking up on that little thing. Yeah. I think also in school and for adopted kids, we can present with challenging behaviours or behaviours of concern, as I like to call it. Maybe not straight away, but the signs are often there when we're young, but we can develop them late when we're older. And I think for me, having my teaching as support assistant there with me, she, yeah. Understanding and recognising what was behind as well. that behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. she kept everyone else at school sane. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She was brilliant. Yeah. And also, yeah, just sweet little things. Like I was very much into art and so I would often describe myself through art. So I wouldn't speak to you, I wouldn't talk to you. I'm not trying to be rude, but the only way I could really express was by drawing. And so then she'd see something I've drawn, go home, paint it in a spare time bring it into me so she was like including me in that and that yeah. just meant everything to me so the individualization of an yeah. experience that really uh resonates i think with an adopted person because you feel special yeah in a nutshell yeah, yeah. it just makes you feel accepted you're there yeah. you're seen that's it that's the most important thing yeah being, being seen being heard not and not just being that problem that's there passed on <laughs> yeah yeah passed on problem definitely it's, um... And what about the relationship with your peers? Because I think, and you both had different experiences, but... Well, my best friend never knew I was adopted until the very last year. And I only told her because I thought, if I'm going to leave, <laughs> this is going to be it. I want you to know this thing about me. But then even I didn't say that. She had to sort of coax it out of me. And why is it that you didn't tell peers? Personally, I was ashamed of, not me, of the fact I was adopted. I wasn't ashamed of that. I was more ashamed of the woman who adopted me. I didn't think she was the mother I deserved or wanted. So I didn't want, and also I, I didn't know my mum. I was adopted when I was six. So like I knew my mum and mm. this lady was not my mum. Mm. She hadn't treated me very much like a mm. mother should. So I, it, I did not feel comfortable calling her mother. That's where so we differ sort of massively. It came out yeah. for me. Yeah, we def I, think, I think, yeah, being adopted at three, I, I remember like Jess Davian sat in that courtroom being told that that's mum, <laughs> that's guardian, what are you going to call them, mum and whatever. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and I've just always seen seen it like that, quite black and white. And I, because me, I have not a single memory of my mum. I can't. Of your birth mum. No, yeah, of my birth mum. I'm not, I'm not a single, I can't picture her, can't feel her, can't smell her nothing not, not i mean i could look at a photo and still no memories come back nothing nothing comes to me i can't i mean even when i look through my file detailed stories detailed i yeah, say if they were in a lineup no i know you won't choose on i mean like literally the only reason i could recognize this because i know what she looks like from photos now do you know what i mean but if you'd put me in a lineup at like six i'd we couldn't, couldn't tell you we really couldn't tell you i'd blocked all of that out so bad and still to this day got such mental blocks on it and i think that's why i could just yeah that's one mm. really and just switch off and just because i mean I, I don't even think i acknowledged my own adoption until i was in my teens to be honest yeah <laughs> for me it was just all normal I just did kind you, of got on did, with it. Did you tell your peers that you were adopted at school or did you not? Uh, primary school, um, I mean, I suffered quite harshly from PTSD and attacks of PTSD. And so it was, um, I wouldn't want to, but 
<laughs> the attack basically forced me to force yeah, you to I mean you'd have such a breakdown out of nowhere that um yeah you you kind of have to, you make your best mates going so what was that <laughs> you know what I mean? well, how can I, I mean I mean like they want to help do you know what I mean they want to help you through these situations any good friend that. does do you know what I mean mm -hmm. but yeah I remember sitting down my friend at the time, my best friend at the time, just explaining it all to him. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> you feel bad because you've le lived it your whole life and you're so used to it, it just doesn't even feel like much of a, a thing. And then you realise how scary your story is once you tell it to someone. Yeah, and then they look back at you like, whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and you're like, what is my life? Yeah, and uh, so for me, my whole life up until, I mean, I'd only told one person and then I kind of hit 18 and had my, my, my real group of friends that I'd happily spend the rest of my life calling my friends, do you know what I mean? And uh, telling all them my life story one very drunk evening. And um, I think that was the moment I acknowledged that I had had a troublesome beginning because up until 18 I mean I hadn't even acknowledged it I, it wasn't a thing it was just what I lived with how I got through day to day and I'd just kind of gone everyone has their their baggage mine's no different from everyone else it's that's that you know what I mean? yeah well, you didn't know better, no. yeah you don't know any better and it's, it's when you tell someone your story and they're like huh what and um, then you have that moment to just be like, yeah, cool, right, Matt, I'm rubbish. <laughs> are you going to cut us off, Mike? I'm waffling. No, I'm really, really sorry. I, this is so fascinating and brilliant to listen to, but we're going to run out of time and I've got, there's, there's someone else waiting to go on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Really sorry. Yeah, I should, uh, yeah, okay, well, we are all but... done here. No, 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 I mean, it's so fascinating. I could listen to you guys all day, so I'm really sorry to butt in. But, um, but I don't want to cut off someone else's time altogether. So to thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jamal and, J and JP and Tanya. That's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right, I hope somewhere we've got Cassian Rawcliffe, who's from UEA. Um, I, I know that he'll explain this to you as he presents, but we... Um, we put out a survey earlier in the year to adopted people and one of the questions was around maintaining relationships and Cassian has done some fantastic work along with Beth Neal at UEA to put this together so he's gonna present that now is that all right Cassian? That's wonderful yes uh, no, no, yeah thank you um yeah so yeah I'm Cassian I'm a researcher at the UEA um and yeah so this is uh I'm presenting a research briefing that was um based on a survey that Mike and Leon at PAC UK carried out um, and we analysed it together with uh, Professor Neil at the university. Um, so we have the Centre for Research on Children and Families there. Um, ah, I need to present my screen, don't I? <laughs> so here we go. Um, how is that? Has everyone got that? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, it was a online survey um, and it was sent to uh, 1,600 adopted adults and we got 392 re replies. Um, if you look at these graphs, they, yeah, you can see that they are mostly white British and over the age of 35. Um, but actually, if you look at that smaller graph, um, over 60% were over the age of 50. Um, so yeah, so it's important in understanding this, um, briefing this, the majority of people who took part, their experience was of a very closed adoption. Um, and most were adopted at a time when there would not have been any thought of the possibility of birth family contact. Um, so this briefing focuses on one particular question within the survey and it was on the theme of this year's adoption week um, and it was this so the respondents were asked this year the theme of national adoption week is about maintaining relationships with birth family after adoption what are the most important what are your most important priorities around this 
Um, and of the 392 people who filled in the survey, 231 of them answered this specific question. And then between us, we analyzed it, we collated them all together and we saw you know, the, the, the pervading themes and what people were trying to say as a whole um, and distilled it down into um, our briefing. And a lot of the things we found were things that have been said so powerfully by everyone here this afternoon. Um, and beneath it all, and what it all amounts to really was this, a call for change really, um, in how we approach um, maintaining significant relationships after adoption. So, as respondents, well, some of the respondents pointed out, um, and has kind of been talked about this afternoon as well, there's this myth around adoption, that it's a, a new beginning, a new identity, a, uh, a fairy tale like narrative of a single family that does not need to include the birth families. And quite often in this story, birth families are seen as bad and adoption is happily ever after. But overwhelmingly, this was not the experience of people who responded to this question. And uh, we had four main key findings. So the first of those findings was that first and foremost, there was a widespread call for birth family relationships to be prioritized. So a small number did not think it should be, but the vast majority saw birth family contact as an essential component of understanding heritage and identity. And this you know, mirror, you know, mirroring back what Lara was saying earlier, um, this quote here, one of the respondents said, adoptees do not arrive as a blank slate. We have our own history and family tree no matter the circumstances of how we came to be adopted. And this resonates with other research that tells us that although many adoptees are happy, have a lot of happy things about their adoption, their past is not something to be hidden or ignored because actually it matters greatly. Now the call for this prioritization of birth family relationships was not uninformed or naive. Uh, it came from people who have experience of this and there was, and with that experience, there came this careful note and advice of um, caution in approaching this subject. And it was born out of the potential safeguarding risks, but also the emotional risk that comes from potentially an unfulfilling reunion and even, you know, the risk of further rejection. And in advising caution, they emphasized the need for informed choice for adopted individuals. And whether you make the choice to explore and pursue contact or if you choose not to that must be respected and so that brings us to our second finding um, which was that respondents felt their needs as adopted people had not been prioritized and overall they spoke of two uh two needs that they didn't feel were really taken on board um those were of identity and their need to know and understand and those of emotional support in managing the emotions related to their adoption and the demands of navigating contact and these different relationships that they have. And several respondents spoke of conflicting feelings in trying to balance the needs of their adoptive family and their own needs and the guilt of potentially upsetting their adoptive family. Our third finding was that there was a need for support that doesn't end with childhood. Um, and respondents spoke of an ongoing need for both practical and emotional support. The practical support around finding and making and mediating contact with birth relatives, as well as how to manage that relationship going forward. And the therapeutic support for navigating the emotional demands of those relationships, as well as just for dealing with the often unacknowledged difficulties that are inherent in their experience of adoption. And our fourth key finding was this call for open and honest discussion around birth family contact. And that includes the pitfalls and the dangers of it, as well as the potential benefits and joys. Um, repeatedly, responses referred to how a lack of honesty had made things worse and had exacerbated their difficulties. And there was a re recognition that to make informed decisions, to truly prioritize the needs of adopted people, 
there needs to be an informed, nuanced and honest conversation about it. Not just within the families, but also across the wider, our wider society. So, knowing this, what needs to change? So from this study, we are making three recommendations. The first is that there needs to be robust contact planning for all adopted children. And this planning needs to take a whole lifespan view of contact needs. It's not good enough to simply assign letterbox contact once a year or twice a year and then just forget about it. The adoption plan needs to consider a reasoned consideration of contact risks. And if contact is not safe at the time of adoption, it needs to be clearly explained why and plans need to be put in place so that is reviewed. And we need to change the narrative of adoption and birth family contact. We need a, uh, a more nuanced understanding of adoption that holds both the benefits of adoption and recognises the emotional and the identity needs of adopted people and the importance of those safe and meaningful contacts. And we need practical and emotional support across the whole lifespan. So taking a lifespan view of it might help to understand how these different recommendations come into play and importantly, who they involve. So firstly, the planning needs to be baked in at the beginning and involves the families, the professionals and the courts. And what came across repeatedly within people's responses is the harm that no contact can bring. And so when planning for adoption, there's a lot of consideration of the risk of contact, but we also need to consider the real harm of no contact. At the planning stage, that must be considered. And when it is safe, it needs to be prioritized. And when it isn't safe, the plan needs to say why. Furthermore, it needs to look forward and it needs to consider what contact might look like further down the line and when it might happen. And it needs to consider, so at the time of adoption, often these are the most contested and adversarial situations and trying to make realistic plans about adoption might not be well, realistic at that point. And so that needs to be taken into consideration. And it may be so in that case, you know, you, you plan for a year's time to review the whole situation. Or as, as the adopted person grows up, maybe when, the, when they go to high, start going to high school, you review it when they turn 16, or when there's you know, significant life events like bereavement or illness or whatever, really. We just need to understand that needs change across the lifespan and our planning needs to take consideration of that. Now, the practical and emotional support side of things needs to be available across the whole lifespan. And as this study and what everybody has been saying this afternoon clearly demonstrates, it needs to encompass adulthood as well, because adoption is a lifelong experience and support needs to reflect that. And changing the narrative, our third recommendation, is something that I think needs, it starts with adulthood and with adult adopted people, because the new narratives of post-adoption contact need to be informed by those lived, with lived experience. So throughout the survey, responses called for peer knowledge, the sharing of people's real experiences of contact in all of its complexity. The people most qualified to inform the change we need are those people who know. So although this study provides a snapshot of feelings and thoughts of adopted people around the whole the issues of maintaining birth family relationships, it is just a snapshot and there remains a wealth of experience and insight within the adopted adult population and that needs to be at the forefront of how we approach supporting adopted people and helping them to maintain their significant relationships and there is a lot more detail in the actual briefing itself so that's available at yeah on the pack uk website you can also find it at the uea as well um and Thank you, but yeah, it's been a real privilege being part of this project and being here this afternoon, hearing your yeah your powerful testimonies and insights. Thank you very much.
Great. Thanks very much, Cassie. And that's great. Cassie has done an awful lot of work on this, along with myself and Leon and uh, Beth, but Cassie has driven it along. So thanks so much for presenting that. We, are, we were hoping to get a small chat about it, but I think that's unlikely because we've already run out of time. But I think in some ways it's self-evident. We've come full circle uh, from where we started at the beginning, really, asking questions about contact and, uh, and the future and listening to adopted people. And the link for this uh, paper is there in the chat. For me, uh, the big word which has come out of today is honesty, actually. Um, there is, and it appeared on one of Cassian's slides. We saw it in action between uh, Shania and her birth mother. And it's come up in all the speaking that everyone else has done about adoption today. More honesty and openness about what's going on. Contact isn't gonna be for everybody, but let's have an honest conversation about it and what's good for people. Let's be honest with people about their adoptions and their situation and uh, and talk more with each other. So that's my little little drawing out of it that has come. Uh, as I said to you, we really want to try and amplify more the, the voices of adopted people. And uh, tomorrow, our uh, big consult with adopted people will be coming out. We'll be spreading that as far and wide as possible. If you've attended today and you're on your our mailing list, that will reach you soon, but it will be on social media and anywhere we can think of putting it. So if you are adopted or you are in touch with adopted people or work with them, it would be great to get them to fill that in because that's how things are going to change is by people having a voice. And all those people aren't going to agree with each other. They're not going to necessarily going to agree with me, but just for them, for them to be listened to at all is the most important thing, I think. So just a, a few thanks first to all our fantastic presenters. You've all been totally brilliant, just totally brilliant. It's been a a completely mind-blowing day and um, and to Leon and Emma my colleagues who've been on the tech side of this and Tanya downstairs and anyone else who's helped with this event um, thank you so much as I say we've got birth parents you can still sign up for Wednesday afternoon at one o'clock uh, really worth listening to and then we've got our round table um, at Thursday at one so great thank you very much for coming everybody and uh, take care bye-bye